Good morning, members of the planning committee. Good morning, members of the public. You're all welcome here this morning for today's meeting on Wednesday, the 7th of October. May I first of all remind you all of some of the domestic arrangements. Please ensure that the microphones and cameras are turned off when not in use, that you do not interrupt other speakers, that if you wish to speak a point of order, declaration and or interest or request an adjournment, please use the hands up function on the task bar. Members are reminded that they should not have alternative communication lines open, i.e. other scope chats, and that if you are contacted by a third party during the application, you should bring this to the legal advisor's attention. If, that if you're attending the meeting to speak and persistently interrupt the meeting, you may be asked to leave. If members do lose connection to the meeting, they must contact the member support officer, Mandy Smith, as soon as possible. I would like to remind everyone present that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of repeated feelings. The whole of the meeting will be recorded except where there are confidential or exempt items. If you make a representation to the meeting, you will be deemed by the council to have consented to being recorded. By entering this meeting as a speaker, you're also consenting to being recorded by the council and to the possible use of those sound recordings for webcasting and or training purposes. The council, members of the public and press may film, record, photograph or broadcast this meeting when the press and public are not lawfully excluded. I'd like to introduce you to the officers uh, uh, for this morning's meeting. They are Mark Russell, the area plan and manager, Joe Hobbs, case officer, Sam Summers, who's a case officer for the second application, Andy Price, the plan and lawyer, and Robert Carmichael, my the governance officer. I'd now like to move to the agenda. And item number one on the agenda is apologies and substitutions, if there's any. I'm going to ask the uh, government officer, uh, Robert Carmichael, to do a roll call for members present. Thank Robert? You, Good morning, members. If you could please respond with. I can hardly hear you. Uh, is that better, Chair? Not really. Oh, what's going on here then? Hello? Working better, Chair? That's bad. Yes. Yep. Oh, apologies for that, members. I'm not quite sure what happened there. Um, if members could please respond with um, good morning or present. So, Councillor Sue Ayres. Good morning. Councillor Melanie Barrett. Present. Councillor Peter Beer. Present. Councillor David Busby. Morning. Councillor John Hinton. Present. Councillor Lee Jamieson. Morning. Councillor Mary McLaren. Present. Councillor Adrian Osborne. Good morning. Present. Councillor Alison Owen. Good morning. Councillor Lee Parker. Present. Councillor Stephen Plum. Present. And I'll just check for the ward members. I believe we have Councillor Zach Norman. Uh, present. Thank you, Councillor. And I know that council. I think I saw Councillor Maybury. Yes, present. Good morning. Good morning, Councillor. And we've heard from Councillor Arthi that he will join uh, slightly later on in the meeting if he isn't listening at the moment. So we're all here, Chair. I believe that we're still waiting on a couple of the public speakers um, to get in. We've got the ob one of the objectors and the. Uh, a applicant, um, but we'll just, um, I believe my colleagues we'll, on the phone we'll about that, but we'll go to the, um, we'll go through the formalities chair and then we can see yeah. where we are then. Yeah. Thank you. Right, uh, we'll move on then to item two, declarations of in interest. Have members got any? No, no hands are up, so I'll take that as no. Then we'll move to item three, which is to confirm the minutes of the meeting held on the 23rd of September. 
Um, you've all seen these now. I think they're Chair, if I might just interrupt. Yeah. Um, yeah. Apologies. There is one slight amendment to the minutes um, that I noticed yesterday is in the merge. For some reason, the um, attendance of officers and ward members was missed off. So I would ask um, that I be able to uh, put in the uh, attendance for the meeting um, as part of a, an amendment. Uh, well, yes, I should think members will agree to that because that will be a true record because you'll just get it from the record and as to who attended and uh, the members. Uh, yes, I think that would be OK. Do I have a second to, for that to be or a proposal with that, please? Councillor Ayres? Yeah. yeah. And Councillor Osborne? Yes, or, proposed. Or seconded seconded. Um, and that's with the amendment that um, Mr Carmichael has just uh, referred to. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. All right, and so it's coming up all over the place as well. Uh, thank you. Um, is there any other comments? No, then I'll ask uh, Rob to do a roll call, please. Thank you, Chair. If members could please respond with for, against or abstain. So, Councillor Suez. For. Councillor Melanie Barrett. For. Councillor Peter Beer. Four. Councillor Dave Busby. Four. Councillor John Hinton. Four. Councillor Lee Jamieson. Four. Councillor Mary McLaren. Four. Councillor Adrian Osborne. Four. Councillor Alison Owen. Four. Councillor Lee Parker. Four. And Councillor Stephen Plum. Four. Thank you, Chair. That is carried. Thank you. Well, they'll be signed at the next practical opportunity, members. Thank you very much. Now we'll move on to item four, which is to receive notification to petitions in accordance with the Council's petition scheme. Uh, officers, is there any you're wishing to call? Thank you, no, Chair. Thank we have one petition to report this morning. Good. Um, so we have one, received one petition regarding, regarding item 6A on the agenda, which is DC 190567, which is the application in Sproughton. This was received with 240 valid signatures supporting the following statement. We wish to voice a number of strong objections that we have with regard to the proposed development of additional properties on open space to the side of Burstall Lane and Le Burstall Lane and Lorraine Way, also known as Hope Farm. Policies that are from the Baber Local Plan 2011 to 2031 core strategy and policies part one of the new local plan, SAVE policies, NPPF, regional planning guidance for East Anglia, the Suffolk Structure Plan 2001, all combined to support the protection of our countryside and greenbelt areas. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, and um, members, is there any site inspections you wish to call? I'll take that as no then. Thank you. So we've noted that. Um, we'll move on to item six then, which is the plan and applications for determination by the committee. Before we go into it, uh, Rob, do we have the other invited guests with us now or are we still waiting? Right, I'm just checking, Chair. So we have mr levitt we also have rob snowling we've got rona german i think the only person we're missing chair and we've got apologies councillor um hudson i missed you off earlier councillor hudson is here in his role as county councillor as well so apologies for that councillor um the only person we're missing is councillor is councillor helen davies of sproughton parish council um i believe that it's possible my colleague claire could be on the phone to her at the moment. OK, we'll, we'll give you a few minutes to see if you can track her down. OK, thank you, Chair. Members and the members of the public, please bear with us. We're just trying to see if we can get the Parish Council representative, Helen Davis. Um, she's down to speak, so we need to see if we can get her to join us. She may be experiencing some difficulties.
Rob, um, perhaps if um, at some point we could start the presentation um, and then we could try and see uh, whether she's joined us by the time we get to the public speakers. <coughs> yes, I think that would be acceptable, Chair, and as time is moving on at that point, I would suggest that. Um, I know that my colleague Claire is yeah. uh, working hard at the moment to try and um, get it. Well, we'll give it until um, another couple of minutes, 9.45, and then if not, perhaps uh, the case officer, Joe Hobbs, will start them at start then. Okay? Yep. Thank you, Chair. And then we'll stop again to see whether she's here by the time we get public speakers. What's a waiting chair? Are we looking at any way that we can start site visits again, or have we just accepted that the can't happen? I think the same uh, answer applies that they've been given us for the last two or three months, but I'll ask Robert if you can comment on that. Yes, of course, Chair. Um, as far as I'm aware from the decision of the tactical management team of the Council, the same decision um, stands with regards to site visit. Um, on, until that advice changes, I can't advise members of anything else with regards to that. But um, it is under review all the time as things change with regards to COVID as do our daily lives in that matter. So we we are not standing still on that one, Councillor Busby. We're reviewing it with, with the times as they change. Thank you. Thank you. Right, it's uh, just gone 9.45. Uh, Case Officer Joe Hobbs, would you like to um, take us through the plan and application uh, for Sproughton? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. As of members, it's on page 11 to 96. I'll just load up the um, presentation. Maybe one second. Yeah. Okay, Chair, can you see that presentation on your screen? No, I can just see you at the moment. Uh, yes, it's right, there okay. now. And I'm assuming all members have got Fantastic. it. Yep, okay, carry on. Okay, lovely, thank you. So the application before members today uh, is application DC 19-00567 on land north of Burstall Lane in Sproughton, which is just shown highlighted in green on the map there. The application is a hybrid application. Uh, it's part in outline and part in full. I will show plans later on in the presentation that show which parts are full and which parts are outlined. But just to give an overview, uh, the uh, full part is the access road, the actual precise location of the spine road and associated drainage and highway works for that spine road. And the outline component is outline for 92 dwellings plus 13 self-build, including 37 affordable dwellings, 35% within that. Extension to allotments, a community woodland, relocated caravan storage, village car park, and a community use shop or office space building. Um, the application, these parts are in outline, except for access. The access points for the site are fixed, as I'll show you later in the slides. So before I get into the presentation, just want to draw members' attention to uh, tabled papers uh, on page 9, um, 10 and 11 of the tabled papers, uh, the updates for this application. Um, uh, ap apologies, Joe. I think that there's something's gone on here in terms of controlling of the screen. I don't think you are. I've I think lost it. Yeah. I have. Okay. Sorry about this. <laughs> 
I just think I just lost my uh, red outline on the screen. Let me try again. I think it might possibly be Mr. Dupre. Oh. Oh, well, have I done oh. something, Chair? Sure. No, it's, it's, oh, there we are. It's gone back to count. Fantastic. Sorry. Okay. Sure. Thank you very much, Chair. Yeah. That's okay. Thank you. There we I'm go. Yeah. Just, I think that's it. Uh, it's, uh, it's back up, and the okay. game members, if you're not receiving it, just put a hands up. And I'm assuming you're all receiving it. Thank you. Okay. Joe? Yes. Yes, lovely. On the tabled papers, um, page nine, there's some updates to the committee report. Um, there's a matter on heritage, which I will cover later in the heritage part of the presentation, if that's OK. Um, just some additional comments on the representations made, just to make sure that all matters are adequately covered through the committee papers. So I've just added some further clarity on the dark skies issues that have been raised and also um, property value. I've also noted that a delivery statement has been submitted in the member briefing notes and that just supports further what's already on page 42 of the agenda for the committee report and just to update that over 330 representations have been received on the application previously the committee report uh, reported over 300. Another final point I just want to point out in the table papers is that the recommendation um, we have amended it slightly. It's in full now on page 9, 10 and 11 of the table papers. That's just to recognise that Natural England haven't yet formally responded uh, to the final consultation on the appropriate assessment for this application. We're not envisaging they will have any objection. The council's ecologist is happy that we have enough information now to assess this application in terms of its recreational uh, impact on protected sites. Um, but we are just waiting for confirmation from Natural England. So we have sought delegated authority um, to grant consent once that issue is resolved and if there are any problems with that of course we'd bring it back with four members. Um, two further updates since the table papers were published. Uh, members may be aware that the council has just uh, published uh, its revised housing land supply position and Baber District Council can now demonstrate 6.74 years uh, land supply. This doesn't materially change the content of the, of the committee report before members. Uh, the committee report was written on the basis that the council can demonstrate a five year land supply. Uh, also, one final point is we did receive um, comments from Councillor Hardacre. He wanted to make the committee aware that uh, he fully supports the views of Sprong Parish Council and Councillor Zach Norman. I just wanted that to be known on the record. OK, so just to go into the application now. Here we have uh, an aerial uh, flyover of the site, just showing Sproughton. Uh, the site is shown in the red dot. Um, I will go through more landmark features in a second, but I'm just going to play this video, which just shows the flyover from Google Earth of the site. Um, and just to show you, or spin round and show you the context of Sproughton. The site is just to the northwest there of Sproughton Village. There we go. And then just to highlight the site there is just shown in orange the extent of the red line. And then we're just going to show some locational context. So we've got the A14 uh, along the back of the slide there, Sport and Enterprise Park. You can actually see the former Sugar Beet Towers there on the site. This is obviously a slightly older photo. And um, we've got Lorraine Way along with the site there, the B1113 and Burstall Lane. This is a site, the site closer up. So we've got B1113 Lorraine Way along the east of the site there, Burstall Lane along the south. Uh, the Grindle, uh, a road, a uh, no-through road along the north of the site, um, the High Street in Sproughton and Lower Street. Also, just to point out, I'll show you more information later, there's footpath 9, which uh, goes across the application site. Just to give some more locational context, we've got the Wildman Public House on the junction here of uh, Burstall Lane and the B1113. We've got existing allotments. And we've got All Saints Church in Sproughton the Tithe Barn Community Shop, an existing caravan storage site, which some members may be aware of, which is visible from the road as you enter Sproughton. Now we're just going to run through the constraints relevant to the application. Uh, the application site is highlighted in orange there. Sproughton uh, is designated as a hinterland village in the Baber Core strategy. Uh, this is the existing built up area boundary. You'll see the site uh, sits outside of it. Uh, but adjoining just uh, along some parts of the site there. Just highlighted in green there, if you can just see that uh, the existing allotments were actually also registered as an asset of community value. 
and these green uh, shapes to show you where footpath nine is and other footpaths that just run along the site down the Grindle and footpath 22, which runs along the east side of the River Gipping there. And just showing you the, uh, the route through. Uh, also, we've got the application site, the site shown in green there, that's the extent of the special landscape area. Uh, to the north of the slide uh, is white, but this is where the boundary is with Mid-Suffolk. You can just see it just uh, skirts along the uh, north of the application site there, so that's Mid-Suffolk there. And just to show on the south site, uh, south of Burstall Lane, there are tree preservation orders, but they're not within the application site. So just to run through the listed buildings, we've got two maps of listed buildings. Uh, we've got ones uh, in the wider area that I just want to run through. Uh, we've got Fidgens Farmhouse, Grade 2, Thornbush Hall, Grade 2, Runcton House, Grade 2, and we've got St Mary the Virgin Church in Bramford, which is Grade 1, Sporton Manor, Grade 2, and then we have a cluster of uh, listed buildings in the village centre. So we've got two, uh, we've got two and four, Lower Street, Grade 2, Walnut Cottage, uh, lower house and stores grade two and numbers two and four um, church close. Now I've split these two slides into wider heritage assets and then heritage assets which are more affected by the uh, proposed planning application as detailed in the committee report. This slide shows the key listed buildings that we've uh, uh, have concerns over the heritage harm with in the um, with the assessment of the proposal. We have the Grindle House on the location on the Grindle, which is Grade Two. We've got the Wildman Public House on the corner there, Grade Two, and then we have Church of All Saints, um, uh, which is a Grade uh, Two star listed building uh, in the village centre there. Sorry, a second, and then we go to the Tithe Barn and Root Barn, Grade Two and support and hall and mill and mill house grade two. I will go through in more detail the impact on the heritage assets later in the presentation. So just the final three constraints here, we've got uh, flood zones two and three outside of the application site, but just wanted to show you the extent of those there to the east side of uh, Lorraine Way. This site is well located outside of those. But there are some areas of surface water flooding. So here we're just looking along the Grindle, along the north of the application site. We've got uh, the extent of one in 30 chance of predicted surface water flooding and one in 100 chance of predicted surface water flooding. This matter is considered further in the uh, committee report, as you'll see. The agricultural land grade is one final matter. We've got the grade two agricultural land shown in brown. Uh, the application site is now outside of this and, and grade three agricultural land, uh, which the application site falls within. So I'm going to show some videos and photos of the site now. I appreciate members may well have viewed the virtual site visit material, but just for completeness, um, I will need to show the uh, videos uh, uh, of the site to give some context this presentation. So video two will travel south down the B1113. Video three will come up Lower Street and cross over onto Burstall Lane. And then video four will come down Burstall Lane, show the other view. And um, just to highlight the footpath nine, that's the route through the site, which I hope your members are aware of now. So if I just play the videos as we're just coming into the village here, we've got the caravan storage, the existing 30 mile speed limit, caravan storage to the right of the site there. There's an existing field access, the posed site access will be just here on the right hand side of the slide. And here we travel to the uh, allotments on the right of the slide now and the Wildman Public House to the right there. We've got the junction with Lower Street and on the left, Burstall Lane on the right. And now we're travelling down um, High Street. I just want to give members uh, uh, some context of the um, highways and the traffic issues as they have been raised in a large number of the representations made on the application. Okay, and then if we move to the video on Lower Street, so this is taken from Church Close, you can see Sproughton Manor uh, straight ahead in the Sproughton Hall, sorry, straight ahead in the uh, photo there. And now we're just moving to go past the Tithe Barn towards the Wildman Public House at the junction.
again just to show some of the um the traffic issues on the um street obviously we have on street parking i uh, will go through the highways issues later in the presentation I just want to uh, point out as well, the, uh, there is the time and date stamp on the video. Um, this was taken uh, around quarter past five um, on a weekday, um, but appreciate it's obviously only a very small snapshot of the, uh, uh, the, the traffic situation. Um, but uh, as I'll cover later in the presentation, there has been extensive transport and traffic information submitted by the applicant, applicants, uh, which Suffolk County Council have considered. So now we're just traveling north up Burstall Lane we have the existing allotments here on the right, which you can't quite see from this angle. And then we have the application site just uh, appearing here on the right now as we go past the 40 mile an hour speed limit signs. I just want to draw members' attention. You can see the uh, topography here, the uh, road, the land of sea is uh, raising in level as we come out of the Gipping Valley. Appreciate this video is a bit dark, but uh, well, the fourth video shows the site in a slightly lighter context, which we'll see in a second. There's footpath nine sign on the right of the screen there. Mm. And the house we can just see at the top of the uh, site there is uh, the firs. There we go, and we'll just go on to video four now. So we have got the fares on the left, and we are just travelling down now, and you can see the uh, site, uh, which we will reach when we get to footpath nine sign. That just gives you a bit of a, a view of the topography of the site as well. So here's the footpath nine sign coming up on the left here. So this is where the extent of uh, the application starts on the left here. You can see a mature tree on the left hand side there, which is proposed to be retained uh, adjacent to the allotments. And existing residences there to the right hand side, the south side of Burstall Lane. Right, now we're just going to run through some of the photos. Um, there are a number of viewpoints which members will hopefully have seen from the virtual site visit. Um, we're just going to run clockwise around the site, starting uh, in the village centre and then uh, moving around the site with some videos and some photos. So just showing the photos on Lower Street. Um, 1A is obviously looking up Lower Street where we just have the uh, video and we've got the Wildburn Public House. There's a mixture of photos, um, hopefully in this presentation, which show uh, recent photos in summer, but also, as you see from the top right-hand corner, there's some photos that were taken in 2019, which uh, were taken in March 2019, which just show the site with less vegetation, just hopefully give members a all-round view of the site at different states, stages of the year. So we have the allotments here, obviously in spring. And now we're looking at viewpoint two. You can just see the photo positions in the centre of the slide there. I won't linger too long where we've had recent videos, footage, and here we are looking across the site from viewpoint two. This is a video, I'm just going to play viewpoint three, so the public footpath, just doing a full 360 degree spin. So that's the footpath location. And just looking down south, the caravan storage and the allotments to lane. And then this is an early photo taken in 2019, uh, just looking south down Burstall Lane and um, showing some um, previously removed uh, vegetation along that boundary there. I will go through the uh, landscaping proposals later in the presentation. But also I just wanted to point out that you can faintly see the church, um, Sporton uh, Church just um, here. It's a little bit faint, I appreciate. Um, and it is uh, more covered by uh, vegetation trees in the summer months, but I just want to point out that is, there is a visibility of that there. 
And then we're just looking from viewpoint 4A. So this is just taking next to the uh, firs. You can just see the fence on the bottom photo there. So we're looking across the site. You can see the uh, land drop. Uh, so you can't see all of the site as the land drops down. Uh, the white uh, building uh, there on the bottom photo is obviously the Ladoria building in Sport and Enterprise Park. And here we are just slightly further down viewpoint 4B, so not quite on footpath 9 yet, but it's again just showing the site, um, kind of uh, the topography as the site slopes down the top photo there. We've got the Grindle um, house, the white building, just the left hand side of that photo, and the caravan storage, uh, which are the white features just on the right hand side of that photo. And just swinging back around from viewpoint uh, 4B, uh, we've just got uh, the Furs and Property Oak Dean, which the uh, neighbours to the north of the site. OK, so now we just move to viewpoint 5. So we're on footpath 9 and we're just looking down towards uh, the well, uh, northwest corner of the site. And again, the right hand photo just shows that uh, visibility there of the Grindle House. And looking, swinging around from viewpoint five, uh, we've got caravan storage on the left photo. And just on the right photo there, I just want to point out those two tall, tall trees and um, are quite useful uh, reference points in the landscape because they're to the rear of the Wildman Public House and next to the allotment. So that kind of gives you the indication of the position of the uh, Wildman Public House listed building when you look at the remainder of these photos. Uh, this is just a photo taken earlier in um, 2019. You can see the uh, Ladori building still under construction on the right hand side of the photo there. And again, it's just to show the landscape uh, in a more winter setting rather than a more leafy summer setting. And just a close up there, just showing uh, the historic um, core of uh, Sproughton. We have Sproughton Hall, uh, the red tiled white building roof on the left of the screen there. Uh, community uh, tithe barn and again the, the church is behind uh, the vegetation so it's slightly hard to see in, in that picture there but it is behind those trees. So we just have a quick video of viewpoint six which is the north uh, west corner of the site. Showing those two trees that there which uh, show the, um, the building of land. And that hopefully shows that sloping side that we have there. And that's the location of footpath nine as it exits the site to the northwest. OK, now we have a video taken from the Grindle. So this uh, is with the Grindle house listed building um, behind me here. Just going to do a 180 degree spin of the camera. Baseball. One second. Here we go. So the video is a little bit juddery, but it's just to give the uh, just to give the. Uh, I'm not sure if that's working for members. It's looking a bit um, chaotic that video for me, but uh, it's to try and demonstrate the uh, extent of vegetation along the Grindle there. Um, let's just see if that will play again a bit better. There we go. Um, there's a slight change in land level with the Grindle Wing lower than the, the application site, and so quite mature vegetation along that boundary. Those two features about the members' viewpoint. Okay, so now we're on the rainway. We're just going to look at the viewpoints uh, down the rainway back to the village centre. Uh, here we are on the uh, east side of the rainway opposite the application site, just looking towards Bramford and across towards the uh, uh, River Gipping. Starting on the left hand side photo, we're looking back down towards the uh, village, Sporting Village here. The middle photo, uh, it's into the application site. You can see the uh, sloping application site in the centre of that photo there. And on the right hand side, you have the Grindle. 
in viewpoint 8b uh, just to show members you may recall uh, the application site on the east side of Lorraine Way uh, which members refused uh, application 49 dwellings which is currently going through appeal that's, that's the application site you can just see um, from this viewpoint here and then um, right hand side is looking back down towards Sproughton here we have the caravan storage, uh, which you may have seen from the videos earlier, and just looking north back towards Bramford and the location of the 60 mile an hour speed limit, national speed limit. It's just a couple of photos within the site now, um, just to show uh, visibility uh, from viewpoint 10A. The centre photo shows those two trees, which I pointed out earlier, obviously the rear of uh, the Wildman Public House. And the photo on the right just looks uh, to the northwest of the uh, site from that position. And here's a photo taken earlier in 2019, again, just showing the site without the obviously the trees in leaf, just showing a bit more visibility there, obviously, of the Wildman public house. So just taken slightly higher up the field, you can just see the, the Doria building uh, just uh, in the centre of the photo on the left hand side there. And now we're just moving back towards the village centre. We've got the existing uh, field access off Lorraine Way into the uh, application site um, and the uh, road to the north uh, towards Bramford. So we're back towards the village uh, centre now um, and the crossroads Wildman Public House. And the bottom photo just shows the, uh, the car park of the Wildman Public House. And there we go. You can just see this is the view from within the car park of the Wildman Public House. So just one final video now, this is the junction of um, Bursal Lane. Okay. That's the end of the photos and the videos. I'm now going to run through the proposals. Um, obviously, application is in outline, but there are a number of plans submitted to support the indicative uh, information um, with the application. So here we have the site um, outlined in red um, with the land within the applicant's ownership within blue. The application is submitted by Pigeon Investment Management on behalf of the Phoenix uh, Thornley Cobbled Agricultural Trust here in this land. Here we have the proposed site layout imposed on the aerial view. Um, I will go into more detail of this, um, but here you can see the access road driving to the centre of the site. I will go through in more detail in the future slides, but I just want to introduce the uh, extent of the proposals in the wider landscape here. Now, um, just to uh, highlight to members, the previous scheme uh, was submitted as shown on the slide here. Um, I just wanted to point out just that are some comments uh, uh, obviously raised in representations about moving of allotments and a cricket pitch and an office and nursery. Um, the cricket pitch proposal um, has been removed. The allotments are being retained in situ now. They're not being proposed to be removed, moved further to the west of the site and uh, the uh, site has uh, been rearranged and the office D1 nursery use is now proposed to be a community office or retail space. Um, just to fade through to the new proposals, if I just leave the previous ones on the screen there, you can see the uh, proposed development has been brought back down to the uh, east of the site. Uh, the previous proposals for self-build uh, further along Burstall Lane and caravan storage um, along Burstall Lane, that has been removed. The application site is now um, much located uh, to the east on the lower land levels. The application, it came in 2019 um, and after the original uh, consultation went through, the applicants did work with the uh, parish council and local community to try and respond to the concerns raised, which resulted in the allotments being retained in situ, um, changes to the uh, no cricket uh, pitch because it was considered by the community that, that wasn't necessarily something that was needed, um, and the removal of the uh, proposed development uh, further to the east of the site. Um, I will show you shortly where the relocated caravan storage is, but obviously it's now all much further uh, closer to the uh, main village. 
So I just want to go through the uh, nature of the outline and the full proposals now, so hopefully members um, can see that in detail. I'm just going to show the accesses which are proposed um, in the outline. So all matters are reserved except for access. Access is being applied for. So we have Burstall Lane. We have an access point to the south of the site here and realignment of that road, which I'll go to a bit more detail shortly. We have access on the Rainway. We have access for the caravan storage, which I will show you is located here on the parameter plan shortly, but access here for that um, storage use only, and then accesses for the self-built plots on Burstall Lane here. The parameter plan, I'll break this down and go through a little bit more detail, but there is a parameter plan submitted with the application, and um, if the recommendation is accepted, the development would be approved to be broadly in, in broad accordance with this parameter plan because it has been carefully designed to respond to the constraints of the uh, surrounding site, the landscape and the heritage um, historic assets. So just to pull this apart slightly, we've got uh, the extent of the full application. The full application is shown in this uh, blue colour and the um, slightly uh, dusky green colour. The full application covers the spine road, which is just shown through the site here. This location of these roads here is being applied for in full and would be fixed by this application. Uh, and also the um, uh, the suds feature which supports that uh, that road. So obviously we need to make sure that the surface water from that road can drain into that suds feature. So those two components are part of the full application. The remainder are outlined, so I'll just run through those now. We have uh, self-build plots in two locations, and we have four here shown in pink. Uh, suds and open space shown in green. The relocated caravan storage, which is currently um, just under where the suds and open space uh, note is, the green area, that's being relocated to this uh, hatched area here. And we've got retained paddocks, they will stay there. And we have in light blue a safeguarded uh, land for a potential future relief road. Um, this was uh, something which uh, was uh, raised uh, through the uh, previous consultation um, and as a potential should land to the south of this application site ever come forwards uh, the applicants have intended to safeguard um, a route through this application site so that a, uh, a form of a relief road from the historic core of Sporton to avoid traffic moving through um, Sporton could be um, implemented in future so they're not proposing to implement it obviously as uh, land to the south which would be required to connect uh, to make the relief road functional is not available it's not being promoted as such but to prevent any future such relief road from coming forwards um, to avoid it being prevented uh, the applicants have ensured that the uh, land is safeguarded and would not be uh, developed so it is a, it's just a safeguarding uh, point at the moment so just looking at the centre of the parameter plan, we've got see the spine road. The orange uh, land is identified as a community um, office or local shop use. It is land that is being um, promoted as such and it would be secured um, in a section 106 agreement for a period of time to see whether a use could come forwards. We've got the village car park, so that's just uh, to the north of the existing allotments and uh, connected by footpaths to the main village and I'll go into the uh, zebra crossing and other highway features in later slides to ensure we've got safe pedestrian connectivity. Uh, suds and open space, paddocks which are shown in the green colour and just looking at the south of the parameters plan we've got the an extension to the existing allotments of 0.4 hectares and we've got the remaining nine self-build plots uh, to the south of the site. Uh, just to go through the access arrangements, um, I just want to show how um, cars would move through the site with the proposed changes. Um, so for uh, vehicles to go from uh, Burstall, Lay, um, Burstall Lane to Lorraine Way through the application site, um, the red dot will just show the route through. And uh, the uh, traffic modelling submitted with the application indicate that 30% uh, of the traffic uh, travelling east along uh, Burstall Lane uh, towards the Wildman Public House, they do actually travel north to Bramford. And so uh, it's been modelled uh, that around 33% of traffic that currently uses the junction possibly at uh, um, Wildman Public House could end up using the spine road through the site. So it would in effect provide some relief uh, for the um, existing junction at Wildman Public House. Um, obviously, people can still travel uh, down Burstall Lane to the High Street as this 
route shows that will still remain open uh, but obviously if there's an alternative junction that potentially is uh, less uh, trafficked and with less um, obviously doesn't have a crossroads uh, with the uh, lower street then it may be that uh, people's habits will dictate that they will use the spine road to try and alleviate the pressure on the junction so that obviously is a opportunity and a potential benefit um, for of the scheme and just to show the access into Lorraine Way into the community car park would be there and access for the caravan storage would be in that location. OK, so I just want to go through some of the other highway improvements um, that are proposed with the application. There have been extensive discussions with the highway authority to consider how the highway impacts could be mitigated, but also how further enhancements could be made um, to the village of Sporton from this scheme. Uh, this shows the access in Lorraine Way. Um, we've got uh, a footway cycleway which is proposed um, that uh, will come through the site and then to a, a pedestrian crossing on the road here. I will show um, slightly more um, detailed information in the later, sli later slide on this one. But also just shown in brown here we have a raised table um, integrally a block which is uh, obviously a slight traffic uh, calming feature through the site just to obviously uh, slow the traffic down as we come to this junction and the connection um, with the community use which is to the south of this slide. So here we have the highway improvement works on Lorraine Way. The access into the site uh, would be a formation of a right hand turn um, land just shown in the centre of the slide here. That's the footway cycleway that uh, I referred to, going to the pedestrian refuge, which is just highlighted in orange there, which would create um, a crossing point to the um, east side of Lorraine Way. And also uh, weight restriction signage is being um, relocated to here and also on Burstall Lane, just to make sure that uh, um, no um, heavy lorries can use the spine road to access Burstall Lane, where there is a weight restriction, existing weight re uh, restriction. So this is on Burstall Lane. We've got the um, new junction arrangement here. So existing Burstall Lane runs along the uh, red line, but it's proposed to realign this junction uh, to try and divert the traffic, try and divert pressure away from uh, the Wild Man crossroads, uh, as previously mentioned, while still maintaining that this road is open. Uh, again, we've got some uh, surface features, uh, road materials shown here, and that's the other weight restriction signage that I referred to earlier. The also, there are also highway improvements being secured. Um, we're now looking at the, uh, so we've got the Wildman Public House pretty much in the blue area here with the lower street to the bottom right of the slide. Uh, we've got a proposed bus shelter, relocated bus stop. The bus stop is currently outside the Wildman Public House. So just kind of uh, putting it uh, further north, but just to kind of move it away from the heavily trafficked area of that junction. Um, but also to enable uh, zebra crossing to come forwards um, through uh, this scheme. And that's just the footway which I referred to earlier, which would uh, enable access to the proposed village car park, allotments, community use shop, and obviously the remainder of the residential and the public rights of way connections that the site has, which I'll show in a moment. Uh, this is the Wild Man uh, public house junction, just to show some changes to uh, surface uh, treatment and realignment, uh, which would be secured uh, through Section 106 contributions and planning condition. Just to give uh, some wider highway improvements as well, we've got uh, the improved junction, which I just showed you, the Bristol Lane High Street, uh, relocated 30 mile an hour speed limit. This would go further to the north um, of the application site than it is currently located and new or fresh village gateway signs indicated at the numbers one, three, four and five on the plans there. And finally on the highways, um, members may recall with the uh, Hopkins home site uh, um, to the east of this site, there was a wider cumulative highway assessment work which was undertaken in 2019 to consider the applications that were coming forward in this area um, and to do uh, to consider and mitigate the impacts at uh, this table at the bottom right hand corner here um, there's a series of four works um, to the b1113 um, the beagle roundabout and a proposed cycle link and sport between sport and bramford all of which this application site would uh, deliver uh, proportionate funding through Section 106 agreement, um, so uh, the highway works could all be delivered. 
Um, members may recall, obviously, the uh, refuse scheme of Hopkins Homes was contributing to this. Um, it's noted that this scheme is refused and the applicants have um, agreed to fund the contribution that Hopkins Homes would have made um, should the um, site not come forward. So the appeal is um, dismissed. So we've got certainty still that there would be sufficient funding with all of these sites coming forward to deliver those wider highway improvements as well. So just moving on to the final few details um, with the application, we've got um, indicative uh, affordable housing plan. It's obviously outlined at present, so we don't know precisely the final number of houses which will be proposed and their positioning, but the applicants have demonstrated that there could be um, obviously um, a good mix and uh, a dispersal, dispersal, dispersal of um, affordable houses throughout the development. The affordable housing mix um, is acceptable. It contains six bungalows. Um, we will secure no more than, uh, ensure there's a cluster of no more than 15 in any one location through the section 106 agreement. Um, it will be ensured that the uh, buildings are tenure blind, so there's no distinction between market and affordable dwellings at the reserve matters stage. Um, but uh, uh, officers are content that it's perfectly feasible that they're an appropriate um, affordable housing uh, mix could be secured to the section 106 agreement at the reserve matters stage. Just running through the landscaping plan now, um, the applicants have uh, worked quite extensively to try and ensure that this is a very green development and that there is space for landscaping um, and good quality landscaping within the development and also through the provision of public open space. So just to point out on these plans, I've just shown where the existing woodland is at present and the retained Grade 2 agricultural land shown there by the uh, uh, greeny brown field. The proposals include a community woodland that would be secured through a Section 106 agreement to ensure its delivery and uh, future management. That's located here. There would be um, connections, uh, footpath connections to this community woodland to ensure the residents of the proposed development and also um, hopefully the wider village can have good access to this. There would be new footpaths through the community woodland that would be secured and a new connection to footpath nine, which runs along the uh, uh, left hand side of the slide here. So creating good public uh, rights of way and uh, green infrastructure connections to the wider countryside. You can also see from this slide uh, there's uh, much additional planting. I will show some uh, street scene visualisations in a moment of the uh, landscaping um, as it matures. Um, additional planting also to the west of the site here um, and along the proposed paddocks in the field here um, and also throughout the site. I think it's, it's quite important also to show that there is space for trees within this development, um, within the spine road. Um, space has been left for not only the road, but also um, a pedestrian and cycle footway along the south of the uh, road, which I'll show shortly, and, and also landscaping, because it really is important to make sure at this stage, although it's only outlined, but that we do have space for the quantum of development and the level of landscaping needed to make sure that we can get a good quality design in future. It's just showing the paddock. And here's the street scenes that um, I referred to earlier. So in the bottom left hand side of the screen here, you can see where these street scenes are taken from. So the top one, A, is taken from within the site um, and it's showing the potential community building, which would be restricted to one and a half storeys and um, proposed development, um, residential development in the site. The two bottom um, cross sections are taken from Lorraine Way and they show um, the development um, at five years after completion, after planting, and then once planting matures. And it's to show that uh, there is space and um, proposed landscaping, which will be secured um, through the um, planning conditions to be implemented, um, that we can really soften the appearance of this development and provide some um, um, good screening and just uh, make sure that uh, there's no kind of stark uh, development appearance along uh, Lorraine Way. So also uh, just looking uh, from the east side of the site, again, we've got uh, section C at the top is taken adjacent to the proposed development. So you can see the uh, changing land levels there. 
uh, and also uh, the indicative development. But as we step back from the other side of the paddock, you can see the proposed landscaping on the east side of the paddock and when that matures in that bottom cross section there, just showing that uh, the uh, the view, of, although slightly further back when you look from footpath nine, will be of uh, mature landscaping rather than again stark uh, fences or um, houses, which we wouldn't want to uh, have. And then one final cross section here. We've just got this one. If you've got your backs to the allotments, looking um, looking to the north along the south of the site, um, we've got. Uh, oh, sorry, no, that's the wrong visualization. I'm sorry, members, I'm going to have to skip that. That's the visualization we've just looked at for the community building on the uh, on the east of the site. We will uh, we will move on from that one. So um, I'll come to the planning balance now. Um, I'm just going to run through the key issues and just go into a little bit more detail about the um, harms of the scheme and then look at the uh, benefits of the scheme before I conclude on the um, application. So the key issues which members will note from the conclusion of the committee report is obviously this application is um, the site is outside of the built up area boundary. I think members uh, all know that obviously that's conflict, uh, there's conflict with policy CS2 of the core strategy, but that is a policy which we do have to give slightly less weight to due to its um, age and uh, consistency, inconsistency with the NPPF. Um, local housing need, uh, you may have seen in the report that uh, we had uh, uh, a local housing needs assessment submitted with the application. Unfortunately, this didn't fully meet the requirements of uh, CS11. And so we have to say, we have to note that there still is some tension with this policy with CS11 with regards to housing need. The indicative mix of the proposed development does respond well to the identified needs in our strategic housing market assessment. So the majority of houses are two and three bedroom. That's something that we can secure through planning condition. Um, to make sure that that uh, mix um, broadly comes forward at the reserve matters stage, um, subject to obviously enabling the applicants um, to justify if otherwise. Um, and also the uh, affordable housing, the it is policy compliant, 35%, and the housing mix is um, exactly what is um, required by our strategic housing team. They are happy with the housing mix. And so the application does respond to local housing needs to a degree, but we can't say that we have a full um, assessment that we are content with that demonstrates that there is a local housing need for uh, this development in terms of CS11 of the core strategy. Um, I will come on to um, how we balance that out shortly. Obviously, that is a conflict um, of this scheme. We also have some landscape impacts. You'll see from those slides that there is um, a, a significant amount of landscaping pro proposed with the scheme, but you can't get away from the fact that at the moment there is an agricultural field and the character of that field will change and there will be some visual impacts from the development. Um, I will just go through the uh, impacts in, in the slide shortly. But finally, the heritage impact is the key uh, matter that I want to uh, go through with members. We've got two key um, issues with the heritage impact. The Wildman Public House, um, uh, officers and uh, the council's heritage officer of the opinion that with the um, proposed uh, development it's unlikely this would lead to um, a significant level of harm to the wild man public house um, obviously setting of listed buildings it's not just whether development can be seen from the listed building it's about how the listed building uh, relates to the, its surrounding landscape and certainly um, the wild man public house um, whilst noting there would be a degree of harm with development, um, you know, kind of uh, behind where it's historically been on the edge of the village, it's not considered this would lead to a significant level of harm because of the nature of the public house. It doesn't relate to the site as much as the Grindle House and the historic core of Sproughton. So the Grindle House, uh, we've noted that there could be a low to medium level of less than substantial harm. Um, but as you'll notice from the tabled papers, there is a real potential for that to reduce with the establishment of the community woodland. Now, um, we've advised members to consider the worst case scenario that there could be a medium level of less than substantial harm, because at present we don't have final details of that community woodland planting. And obviously, if um, if the trees um, aren't sufficient enough, then that level of harm um, could stay at medium. But there's every prospect um, our council, the council's heritage officer, considers that that le level of harm. Could could be reduced from low to even negligible if there's a good uh, mature uh, planting scheme for that community woodland. 
The historic core of Sporton, as I call it, um, is a collection of listed buildings. So the church, uh, Sporton Hall, uh, the mill buildings, the tithe barn and the um, root barn. Um, there would be a low, than, uh, low level of less than substantial harm to the setting of these historic attics, which uh, function obviously um, perhaps as a group within the village of uh, historic um, interest. Um, but this harm also has the potential to reduce to a negligible with the final details of the scheme. So the ridge heights of the building, if they're kept to a sufficiently low level, then the harm could be uh, negligible. But again, we don't have the final details to be able to really eradicate that harm at present. So we're advising members to base the recommendation on the low level of um, less than substantial harm. So moving on to um, the benefits. Uh, Obviously, the site is located in a fairly sustainable location compared to other sites within the district. It does have good accessibility and connections uh, to Ipswich and it is in close proximity, obviously reducing the need to travel to key services compared to um, other locations in, within the district. It would also deliver market housing, policy compliant, affordable housing levels and also self build, which is quite a, um, obviously an important uh, factor for the council. We do have a waiting list of uh, over 300 people on the self build register and this could help deliver um, self build plots for people on that register. Uh, the scheme is predominantly two, three bedroom homes. It's indicative mix, as I mentioned, that could be secured through condition to try and give some certainty over the reserve matters. Uh, community woodland is proposed, which is a, a significant benefit, providing recreational access and public rights of way for existing and future residents. We have an uh, extension to the allotments, uh, the numerous highway improvements, uh, which I uh, listed earlier in the presentation, uh, village car park, and also the applicants have demonstrated that there would be a biodiversity net gain to this application site uh, from taking um, a relatively, obviously, uh, farmed agricultural field, which obviously has uh, uh, um, some ecological benefits, but really improving those ecological benefits through the um, planting and mitigation measures, um, which are detailed in the ecological reports submitted with the application. And that would demonstrate uh, a, an improvement and a net gain over the existing situation on the site. There's also a number of measures of sustainable construction, which the applicants have set out, uh, which are detailed in the committee report, which would also um, uh, be of benefit. And although at outline stage, do give an indication of what can be approved at the reserve matters. So we'll go, I'll go through the, uh, the harms just slightly more um, in the following slides. But I just want to bear in mind, obviously, that uh, whilst the council has a five year land supply, which has recently been reinforced with the um, publication yesterday, of the um, land supply position. Uh, we do need to ensure that we boost our supply of housing with the right sites in the right locations. Uh, it's not something uh, that we can necessarily um, sit back on and uh, refuse once we have land supply. Recent appeal decisions have shown uh, for significant schemes that uh, even in the presence of a land supply, we do still need to consider, is this the right location for additional housing to boost that land supply? Um, and obviously from the recommendations um, officers have made, we consider that it is. So just to show the uh, heritage harm um, in a bit more detail, we have the, uh, the Grindle farmhouse, it is um, obviously a heritage asset and any harm to that asset must be given utmost importance. But I just want to draw some distinction perhaps from the um, historic core. The historic core obviously have a series of listed buildings, um, including a um, grade um, one listed building, um, which is also a grade two style listed building of the church, um, which obviously gives it quite significant uh, heritage importance. Um, there is a slightly higher level of less than substantial harm to the Grindle farmhouse, but that is um, only one listed building. And so the, the kind of overall context of the harm perhaps is lower than if we had a medium level of less than substantial harm to that historic core. So I think uh, the, the level of harm of this scheme um, is perhaps a slightly a different situation to the appealed site um, over the road um, on the Hopkins site and on land to the east of Lorraine Way. But this is a different scheme with a different context. The benefits, the public benefits of this scheme are in a very different magnitude to um, other application sites, but we must consider this on its own merits in isolation. Um, 
and the public benefits of the community woodland, the um, 37 affordable housing, um, the uh, extension to the allotments, uh, village car park, and the highway improvements that have um, hopeful benefit to uh, existing residents, not just to mitigate the impacts of this development. They all weigh um, in favour of um, balancing out that medium level of less than substantial harm to the Grindle farmhouse and the low level of harm to the historic core um, of uh, Sproughton Village. Um, also, again, I'll draw members' um, minds to the fact that there is potential as well to reduce that level of harm. This is an outline scheme, and with those final details, um, our heritage officer you know, has indicated that there's every likelihood that those level of harms could be brought down to low levels of harm or even negligible harm with those final details. That does give officers some comfort as well that this could be um, a much less harmful scheme once we have the, uh, the details at the reserve matters stage. The sorry, let's go to the next slide. The landscape impact to just show the uh, special sorry, landscape can area. I just, can I just interrupt yes. you there, Joe? I'm very sorry to do this, but I see okay. Councillor Hinton's hand's been up a little while. I don't okay, know if sorry, he's on a point of order or what. Um, if it's that, I have to take it, but if it's not, then I'll ask. No, him Mr. Chairman, it. just waiting so that I could come in on, on the questions at the end. Oh, right, that's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Sorry, Joe. Carry on. That's okay. No problem at all. So the landscape impact, um, as you note from the report, um, the landscape impact and visual effects are most noted to be moderate to slight adverse, um, but they would be reduced over time with the proposed landscaping that has come in. Now, I know that uh, landscape impact is a matter which has been raised extensively in the representations of the scheme, and there is no escaping the fact that uh, any development on this site would lead to an impact on the uh, landscape and the special landscape area. But through the work that has been carried out through the landscape visual impact assessment, those harms can be um, significantly um, moderated and uh, mitigated by the planting that is proposed. And they really do only bring the, they bring the harms down to slight adverse impact. So that's something which hopefully can give members comfort in the, um, uh, the overall harms of the scheme. I'm just showing the uh, landscaping there on that slide. And that's just obviously to recall the uh, the uh, landscaping that uh, is proposed, but I've gone through those slides in detail, so I won't uh, dwell on them too further. So just to draw it all together now, um, in summary, um, I just want to kind of uh, highlight the harms of the scheme, which hopefully I've, I've gone through in sufficient detail to give members uh, a clear understanding of those, of the site being outside the built up um, settlement boundary, the heritage harm, which is less than substantial, which has been weighed against the uh, public benefits, um, the landscape harm, and the loss of grade three agricultural land, although it's not certain whether it's grade three A or B, um, as soil testing hasn't been carried out, but there is the potential for the loss of three A, which is classed best to most versatile agricultural land. In the, uh, um, and in summary on the benefits, um, I've just listed those on the right hand side of the screen there. I have just gone through those in the previous slide, so I perhaps won't say them all out loud again. But uh, we do have obviously extensive benefits and public benefits too, um, to make a, a benefit to future residents and hopefully existing residents of Sporton um, through public rights of way, the allotment extensions, um, highway improvements for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, and so the benefits of the scheme are considered to be um, significant and compelling in this instance. Um, it's noted, obviously, that there is a high level of um, opposition to the scheme with over 300 letters of objection. And it is something that I've discussed extensively with uh, the parish council, as have the applicants, to try and address the concerns insofar as possible. But the... Um, the planning balance for this application is that whilst there are some harms, those benefits, um, they do outweigh, and the public benefits in particular outweigh the heritage harms in officers' opinion. So just to summarise the conclusions, um, obviously uh, we've got the conflict um, with core strategy, uh, CS2, and there's some tension with con uh, uh, policy CS11 because of the local housing need issue. But the proposals are considered to comply with CS1 and CS15 of the core strategy for sustainable development. Uh, we've got heritage and landscape impact, but we consider them to be outweighed by the public benefits. And this is a sustainable location where we consider that the addition of housing of this quantum um, provides um, obviously a good site to boost our land supply, which is a requirement of the, from the MPPF. 
Um, the benefits are considered to be significant and compelling. There are a number for this scheme. And it is something which I hope, um, whilst Sport and uh, Parish Council and other um, objectors have noted um, they remain opposed to the scheme, there has been engagement with the local community to try and modify the scheme to address some of those concerns from the previous um, and originally submitted application. So this would boost the supply of our housing, um, particularly with two, three bedroom dwellings, which is secured by condition, and the provision of self-build. All highways, uh, infrastructure and highways matters are addressed. There's no evidence before officers to say that there is any um, adverse impact to education capacity, to doctor's capacity, doctor's surgery capacity. Um, uh, contributions are being secured and still um, bids could be made to adequately address all of those matters. And the scheme has been considered in accumulation in terms of highways and landscape. Uh, and infrastructure um, with all other schemes that are consented in the area. And there are no harms which uh, lead officers to recommend refusal of the scheme on that basis. So on balance, um, this is considered to be a deliverable, um, sustainable development and officers recommend uh, permission is granted as detailed in the tabled papers. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, um, Case Officer Joe Hobbs. I think you've um, put forward a very good and full report, very clear and very detailed. I can see you spent a lot of time on it and that's very helpful. Um, before I just go to John, can I just ask one point which you could perhaps clarify and we are now asking for questions of clarifications or that. Um, the, the last uh, few meetings that the um, district council have had we've been surprised at some of the indicative plans that have been shown at this early stage at outlying and then when it gets to detail it alters considerably uh, mix uh, pepper popping uh, road layouts even construction footpath have you taken this on board in this i think you did say that um we picked this up at this outline, uh, but can you just explain that please to us? Yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah. So obviously, yeah, outline consent um, it is uh, indicative of the plans that are submitted, but this application has gone, gone into a fair amount of detail to demonstrate how it can address the um, potential harms to heritage and landscapes and such like. Uh, the parameters plan, um, which I've, I, I could skim back to you, but um, it's further back in the presentation, but the no, parameters plan would be fixed, um, um, that the development should be broadly in compliance with the parameters plan to ensure the development comes forward in those locations. Um, and the spine road in this instance is fixed and so that road would be um, delivered as shown um, in the plans. Now the um, other information such as uh, the um, location mix. of the affordable housing and the housing mix that is obviously something which we do need to give some flexibility to because this is outline stage only but with the affordable housing there would be a clause in the section 106 to ensure that there's clusters of no more than 15 dwellings which would lead to three locations, um, at least in this development. Obviously, we've got 37 dwellings. And uh, we do have a condition on the uh, market housing mix, um, which um, officers are happy to um, include, shall predominantly be two and three bedroom. But also, we need to obviously um, respond to any evidence on housing need at the time. So if there's any refresh of the strategic housing market assessment, we would request the applicants reflect on this. Um, and obviously, um, we can agree a, um, a mix on that. But uh, we would um, we would be looking to try and have a mix broadly in line with what's shown at this stage, unless the applicants can give a reasons justification as to why it needs to be different. Thank you. Ian, our legal um, lawyer, uh, did you want to comment on that? Uh, yes, if I may just come in, Chairman, I'll make myself visible for a moment. And I must apologise to my colleague, Mrs Hobbs. I, I ought to have spoken to her about this before the meeting, but I'll just on the self-build housing, Joe, um, I've not, I've just tried to read things on one screen. I've only got one screen here, so I'm sorry if this point ought to be obvious to me, but we, you have quite rightly advised members that the, um, the presence of self-building housing as a component of this proposal uh, mer merits uh, is a, there's a material consideration in favour of that because of government policy and national government policy and indeed legislation. But I just wonder if you could advise specifically on the extent to which that is um, guaranteed, uh, the, the, the self-built houses are guaranteed as, as of delivery um, by condition. Because um, I'm just thinking that um, as, as we both know, 
self-built housing isn't a use class in itself. It's it, a self-built house is a C3. So in the absence of a condition, a self-built house, an intended self-built house can become a, if you like, a market and a, for want of a better word, a normal house, if you forgive me using that word. Um, so would, is it, may I ask that question? Um, I think that there is a reference. I saw there was a reference to a requirement to market them in the right places, but would, would, you, would you be able to comment further on that, please? Yes, I think, um, yeah, Ian, um, you point out um, a valid point there. There's obviously um, we we will try to ensure that uh, people on our self-build register have the opportunity to take up these plots. But obviously we can't insist that uh, they do come forward to self-build. So whilst we have every hope that um, they, they would be taken up by the uh, 300 plus people on um, the self-build register, um, there is a chance obviously that they could come forward as um, private market dwellings in future. Um, obviously that wouldn't be in accordance with the parameter plan. It may be something that we need to um, seek any future landowner to regularise at a future mm -hmm. date. Um, uh, they need to come forward further, but yeah, we can't necessarily insist on it. Um, but my experience is hopefully that um, self build is, is, is quite a popular concept. Um, but yeah, we do need to advise members that there is a chance that they may not come forward and we cannot insist on that at a condition stage for sure. Thank you, thank you. I thought that was the case. Thank you. That was very helpful. Right, we're now members at the point of clarification by the CAFE officer. I've got Councillor Hinton followed by Councillor Osborne. So, Councillor Hinton, question. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a, a couple of um, a couple of points, really. Uh, I was going to mention the the requirements of CS11, but that has come up, uh, and I'm sure it will come up again in the debate. Uh, but we're looking at an application here, which is for basically permission to build on a field and the roads being fixed but everything else is up in the air or controlled by 106 or conditions um, having numerous conditions obviously just makes things confusing for everybody um, is there anything further that we can uh, clarify in terms of what is actually controlled by this permission we've already heard that we can hope that the affordable housing is going to be in certain positions we can hope that the self bills are going to be there we can hope that they're going to be two and three bedrooms but is what can we do to actually make sure it actually happens because with this particular uh, applicant there is a bit of a history that was uh, dealt with in the last uh, couple of meetings uh, about uh, outline being one thing and reserve matters being something completely different uh, and contrary to what uh, most councillors I think thought would be possible and the second point was um, looking through the list of consultees I see that uh, Mid Suffolk are consulted and have no comments um, with all the housing they've got just down the road I'm not surprised uh, but what about Ipswich we keep on saying easy access into Ipswich but uh, have they got any comments on it? Because obviously it's going to impact upon them when you get uh, all the occupants of these houses potentially decamping into Ipswich either for employment, recreation or shopping or whatever. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, Councillor. Um, yeah, to take the uh, questions in turn, the uh, yeah, this application, um, obviously I think it's... Um, we, we, we can all uh, learn and reflect from previous experience, can't we, as to um, what's happened on other applications. Um, and this application, we do have a very clear parameters plan, which is, um, which, like I say, the development will be broadly in accordance, there'll be a condition to ensure that. So that gives certainty, um, a fair amount of certainty over the position of different uh, components of the scheme but it, it really is those planning conditions that's um that's what will help ensure that say the community woodland comes forward as the uh, um the extension to the allotments comes forwards um we do need to obviously reflect on um the fact this is outlined and we can't insist that the housing mix is as shown in this application but um, I think the conditions that we're proposing and the um, clauses in the section 106 when it comes to housing mix and affordable housing they really will help um, provide more certainty than we have had on previous recent perhaps examples of applications because we are specifying that the housing mix shall be predominantly two and three bedroom whilst enabling the applicants to provide a reasons justification because we do have to be reasonable we do have to allow the applicant to demonstrate um, if there's a compelling reason why they can't meet the precise mix which has been set out in the outline um, but say with the affordable housing um, our affordable housing um, strategic 
housing team are um, very uh, clear that obviously they want uh, development, uh, affordable housing to be um, integrated well into the existing uh, housing development. They don't want it, um, you know, in one cul-de-sac and one aspect of the scheme. And we do have the clause of no more than 15 dwellings and we will ensure um, that the materials um, are tenure blind um, as we say, to ensure that the, uh, there is no distinction between the quality of the final build of those units. So we do we do have the, it's a balancing act of obviously being reasonable at this outline stage, but I do think the conditions that are suggested in this um, application do give us um, a, a good degree of control to make sure that we have uh, the aspirations of this outline scheme reflected when it comes to the, uh, the bedroom sizes and the affordable housing. Um, in regards to Ipswich Borough Council, the, um, they weren't directly consulted um, on this application. Um, there was some uh, distance perhaps between the um, boundary of this, um, the, the borough and this site, but I do take your point that um, obviously uh, this does lead to a um, a reliance um, on the future demand of services uh, when it comes to um, Ipswich. Um, the the key matters which I think we need to um, concern ourselves with are the planning matters. Um, and when it comes to planning matters, we're also looking at the infrastructure. So uh, the highway impact on uh, residents of Ipswich, that has been obviously modelled with the, um, the background data and the transport assessment to think about all the committed developments in the area to ensure that the, uh, the roads can still function. Highways England obviously have an interest um, with the A14. Um, when it comes to other matters such as services, such as um, say shopping, it's obviously a larger, much more of a commercial um, matter. And so it's not something that necessarily can concern ourselves with um, or be a reason to refuse. But the key matters relating to infrastructure um, and the potential pressures on Ipswich, they have, have been considered in this application. So I feel that we've we've done everything that we reasonably can to ensure that uh, there are no adverse impacts cumulatively with this scheme or other consented schemes. I hope that answers your question. It does to a certain extent, if I may come back, Mr Chairman. Yep. Um, but what we've also got to remember is that infrastructure is a little bit more than roads um, and, and access points. And also within the Sproughton Parish, there are already nearly a thousand homes being proposed up at Walsley Grange. So uh, the actual impact on all of the access points into Ipswich and all of the infrastructure, whether it be schools, doctors, shops, water, gas, etc 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 broadband all all everything um is going to be um piling up and we don't seem to take uh, a hard enough line if you like on making sure that these things are uh, looked at and considered at an early enough stage we sort of wait for the problem to come and then try and sort it out afterwards um i don't know if you can clarify that point <laughs> okay uh, right. Um, j just um, just following on slightly from what, what Councillor Hinton has said, I understand what you're saying about the mix and and uh, the conditions uh, to the applicant. But if this was if this site we were minded to approve it, and this site was then eventually sold to another uh, developer, can those conditions be held to that developer? Because this is where we f f um, fell down on a, a previous application. Um, are they strong there as well? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yes, yeah, the um, housing mix condition. Yeah, I have I've considered this to think obviously what's the uh, potential for a condition being uh, appealed and removed at a later date because you you want to make sure you've got certainty. And um, the housing mix condition uh, that we're proposing and the requirement for predominantly two and three bedroom units um, that does reflect the evidence that's in the strategic housing market assessment of what is needed in relation to and um, dwelling size in Baber. Um, so if uh, we were to have um, an appeal to to remove the condition. Um, I do feel that we do have evidence the council is acting reasonably asking for um, the indicative mix to include predominantly two and three bedroom because we do have the evidence to back that up. Um, so I feel that um, even if someone were to challenge that, um, well, I think we, we do have a good case of uh, hopefully um, still having that condition on the, on the dwelling sizes. Thank you. Councillor Osborne, you were next. Councillor Osborne, you're still muted. You're not there. Councillor Osborne. Yes, thank you, Mr. Oh. Chairman. I'm sorry about that. I, uh, my my, uh, mouse, my mouse ran away. Um, it, yeah, the clarification 
<coughs> I want, I've, got, I've got two areas there really, but um, um, first of all, at what stage of this application will the allocation of the affordable be agreed, i.e. La uh, um, local connection need, Baber wide, gateway wide, and what input will ward members have in this decision? The affordable housing would um, be secured when the reserve matters um, are being designed. Um, that, that's when you know the final number of dwellings that you can achieve on the site, because obviously this is an outline for up to 105. Um, there may be further investigations that say only 100 can come forward, so it may be 36 um, affordables instead of 37. So it will be when the final reserve matters are designed and, and submitted. That's when um, we'll know the um, precise uh, location mix of the affordable units. Um, with regard to the um, uh, the allocation of uh, affordable units, that is controlled through the Section 106 agreement, um, but that is something which um, the strategic housing team um, obviously work on more um, than, um, than um, we deal with through the planning application. And that would obviously be once the um, houses are um, being constructed and there's obviously more certainty, um, but that is a slightly separate process to the planning process. Um, so um, I don't I don't honestly can't answer the involvement of um, ward members within um, that discussion, but that's perhaps a question we can put to the strategic housing team. They're, they're not present here today, but outside of this meeting. Yeah, thank you. I'm yeah, sure, thank Councillor. You. I'm sure, Councillor Osborne, that you could put that to uh, the cabinet member for housing um, better than a lot of us. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. But what I would say about that is that the the local connection need, and you've you've seen it as chairman on several applications. In that is that uh, they need uh, they need the local uh, people to have the access to to affordable housing, and it seems that that uh, uh, Baber also should have a, an input into that, and then whatever gateway, and that gateway means that they will be coming in from everywhere else except the local areas so that is my concern and i understand about the affordable setup of it however that would be something that needs to be looked at before we go for any further into the reserve matters um Thank just you. i think you i think you've made your point there i think it's very valid that we do want local people to have local houses and i think we need to pick that up outside the planning meeting um had you got another point of clarification you wanted well, yeah I, I, i'm just uh, with john hinton's thing about highways uh, uh hinton -Sing, no i i need questions for clarification to the officer well um it appears it appears to me, and she can probably um, Joe. Sort of beg your pardon. Joe could uh, tell me. Um, we've got we have these situations uh, around uh, Bur uh, Burstall and and that area, that very thin road running down from the Beagle roundabout. Um, it appears, you know, has County Council? Maybe this should be a question I ask to Councillor Hudson. But um, has has anything been looked at as far as the congestion that will lead no doubt with the other applications that uh, has, has been put in there and around there it, it seems you've got one area that you're you're getting rid of and then you're doubling it up on on the area that uh, you, you've just put this uh, spine road into yeah, the um, the Highways um, Authority has looked at all the um, committed developments um, in the area with this application, but in doing so as well, there are obviously other highway improvements in this area associated with Balsey Grange 1 um, that are proposed to come forward. Um, so obviously, yeah, the, the current highway traffic situation um, is one thing, but the growth that has already been consented um, has mitigation measures identified with it and then along with the mitigation measures identified with this application um, it's considered that the the road network would function um, in an acceptable way um, so I think it's um, it's important to kind of obviously consider that yes whilst there is quite a lot of other development coming forwards though they also have some significant mitigation measures to address their impacts as well. Yeah, the, and the, fi the final point about it is you talk about the weight restriction on, on that road. Is it 115, is it? The, your, your uh, 113, yeah. 113. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, how are you how are you intending to get the enforcement on that for weight restrictions? Because uh, it doesn't work on other areas. So 
I'd be interested to know how you're going to enforce it. <laughs> yes, obviously, um, the existing weight restriction along the Bristol Lane um, is in place and uh, to ensure that no one can use the spine road to kind of um, avoid the uh, weight restriction signs um, or in Bristol Lane. That's why they're being relocated um, um, with through this application. But uh, obviously, yeah, the kind of compliance with those weight restriction signs is, is a wider matter. Um, and is it's there's other measures, there's other um kind of uh, legislation regulations to in, in a, ensure that that happens that those um um restrictions are implemented and so it's not something that perhaps this planning application could concern itself with but i do take your point that obviously your concern over them not being um not being um enforced but unfortunately um this planning application it can't um it can't seek to try and address the, any any wider issue of um, enforcement of other regulations. All we can do is ensure that there is that um, kind of restriction in place to make sure that we don't have the uh, heavy vehicles inappropriately using the site. But I do take your point about the wider issue um, of enforcing these weight limits and other um, highway matters such as that. With the greatest respect to, to you, Joe, I, I you know I, I understand that, but wouldn't it be wouldn't it be better for a committee to to have those put to them at the time that we know this application goes forward i mean you know i understand you go around you go around at other areas outside the application however it still needs to be looked at at the time of an application going in you you can't tell us what how you're going to enforce it that to me is a bit poor but with the greatest respect to yourself because it's a good presentation thank you Thank you. I think she's answered your point. I think, Councillor Osborne, you've got a couple of questions there to the local county councillor. He might be able to help you out on that. Um, perhaps you could lower your hand, Councillor Osborne, and we've got uh, Councillor Barrett next, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, Joe. Um, I note that on the some of the objections that have been raised, uh, a point was raised about pollution on the high street. Has that been taken into account by highways and does it affect this this site as well? And is that is that a factor in re, uh, the, the spine road opening out onto Lorraine Way to ease the pressure on that um, that junction by the, the public house? Yeah, thank you, Councillor. Um, yeah, the air pollution um, is a matter which I've discussed with our environmental protection team. Um, it's not so much um, a matter uh, kind of controlled or um, regulated by highways, it's more so environmental protection. And that is a, a very matter that I discussed with um, our officer in that team, because obviously there are a number of concerns raised over the air quality in Sporton. Um, the, there is routine air quality monitoring within Sporton um, and it is well within acceptable limits at present and there is no air quality management area as there is in some other areas of the district to uh, deal with uh, pollution from nitrous oxide um, and other issues. Uh, the the spine road um, has been designed as such to try and alleviate pressure on the Wildman Junction, but it's not essential to um, address any air quality matters um, in the area. There are not considered to be any air quality matters within um, current uh, regulations and guidance. And our environmental protection officers see that the existing and proposed um, development um, would not lead to any loss of air quality to an unacceptable level. I hope that answers the question. Mm, yes, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Busby. Thank you, Chair. Actually, I've got a couple of points about uh, the, re the report on page 32. Right. Yep. Uh, right at the very bottom, 3.52. Uh, finally, LHNA does not, etc. Could mm -hmm. you explain that? I don't understand that paragraph. It seems to come up with a, a, a solution that, uh, or conclusion that I would have thought was the opposite to the right one. Certainly. I don't suppose you can keep in the paragraph number, could you? My yeah, 3.52. 3 3.52, thank you. Just wait one second. I'm just uh, electronically getting to that page on my other computer. So 3.52. Yeah, so um, 3.52, um, it deals with the submitted local housing needs assessment um, um, submitted by the applicant for the application. Um, the 
Yeah, the, the one of the shortfalls of the um, local housing needs assessment is it identified the projected um, um, households um, modelling different population growth scenarios, but it didn't take account of the committed supply um, of houses, which the council has already granted planning permission for, which is the point that we are um, we are making in that paragraph. Um, we, we, we are just uh, basically being open and honest and clear there with that statement that the local housing needs submitted with assessment submitted with the application doesn't do the job that it needs to do, which is why I've noted in the conclusion that we've got that tension with CS11. It hasn't fully demonstrated that there is the um, local housing need um, um, present. Um, which this scheme uh, could respond to. So that's 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 the whole point of that paragraph, is just saying there is a flaw with what's been submitted in the application. But then obviously in my um, conclusions and my summary of my committee report, I've, um, I've addressed the fact that whilst we have that tension, that conflict, there are other material considerations that we consider outweigh that conflict. Um, and we recommend approval of the scheme. So the requirement to boost our land supply, sustainable location um, and such like. So that's, that's the purpose of that paragraph in the committee report. I did note, um, Joe, when you were going through, you said CS11, still some concerns. So I think you did pick that up at that point. Um, That's fine. What you're, not saying, you're not saying by that, though, that the that the identified need from Sporton, which was 92 houses, hasn't been met by the 505 that Walls de Grange have delivered. Is it, that's not no. what we're saying there, is it? No, it's not what we're saying. No, we're just saying that the applicants haven't looked at committed supply. Yeah. Right. And the other point I had was that uh, on page 36, you don't need to look for this one, Joe. It's uh, it's it's to do with the NPPF 3.74. Mm -hmm. It says, with the required compliance with building regulations, the proposed development is considered to meet the requirements of paragraph 150 of the NPPF, which mm -hmm. seeks to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Just how on earth can a, a development of 100 houses reduce gas emissions? Yes. Emissions? It's, it's the debate, perhaps, sustainability versus sustainable development. Um, with development, uh, there is obviously always going to be um, an environmental impact. But what we're looking to do is to reduce the potential impact of that development by reducing the amount of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions from the development compared to what it could be. Obviously, complete sustainability is the release of no greenhouse gases and, um, um, you know, kind of um, no harm at all. But obviously, with development, there is going to be some harm some, um, Arms. But what we're looking at with the proposed mitigation measures, which would be secured by planning condition, is reducing those harms and keeping the greenhouse gas um, emissions as low as possible on the scheme. OK, so that's, what you're saying is a misleading statement in the NPPF, really? I think well, the NPPF that's obviously did development. <laughs> well, mm. yeah, I mean, either we're trying to reduce greenhouse gas or we're not. Mm. And if we are, then building 100 houses to me doesn't seem unless there's there's something special about those houses which is the point i think that the nppf is trying to make unless there's something special about the sustainability of those houses you're not going to reduce the greenhouse gas mm. and anyway that that's yeah. that's the questions and great report joe and i think you probably deserve a break since you've talked for an hour and a half yeah uh, i'm going to come to that uh, I'm, I'm going to propose we have a, a three minute break after we've done this clarification part um there's no more hands up uh, nobody else has got any points of clarification they want to uh, ch uh, bring up to joe i'm assuming no then because there's nothing up there so we'll now move to the part which is the public speakers but i'm going to propose that we take um a five minute break which uh, means come back for 11 15. in the meantime um robert perhaps you can make sure that um uh, the parish council represented helen davis is with us or you can update us uh, when we come back at about quarter past 11. okay members so uh, a five minute break comfort break and we'll um pick it up at quarter past 11. thank you very much
Brilliant. Thank you, Chair. So I'll just condu conduct a quick roll call vote to make sure we're all back from the break. Thank you. So, Councillor Suez. Present. Councillor Melanie Barrett. Come back to Councillor Barrett. Councillor Beer. Present. Councillor Busby. Yeah, back. Oh, hold on. Two seconds. Councillor Hinton. Present. Councillor Jameson. Come back to him. Councillor McLaren. Present. Councillor Adrian Osborne. Present. Councillor Owen. Present. Councillor Parker. Present. And Councillor Plum. Present. So we'll just go back up the list then. So Councillor Barrett. Uh, Councillor Jameson. Okay, Perhaps chair. Mandy can phone both of them while you're. I'll give it. I'll try again in just another moment, chair. Yeah. Once. Yeah. I'll just ask again then, Chair. Yep. Do we have Councillor Barrett? Yes, yes, I'm here. Brilliant. Thank you, Councillor. And Councillor Jameson? Yep, yep, back. Good. Brilliant. Sorry. We're here. Right. I now, I've just noticed, Chair, that the case officer uh, and Mr. Russell aren't here. <laughs> Apologies. I'm just, I've just messaged them, but I've Just wait for them to rejoin the meeting. Are we supposed to send a quick message when we're back from our um, little No, we did a roll call. Break. Oh, I missed that. Yeah. yeah. Um, we came back to both you and uh, Councillor Jameson. Uh, good morning, right. uh, Councillor Beer. Sorry, I, I, you lost me for a short while. You may not have noticed, yes. but I'm back now. Is he in? Uh, is um, sorry, Mandy. We know. Uh, uh, Joe. I believe we've got Joe back, and, and yeah. Mark. Brilliant. I think we're fine to carry on, Chair. Lovely. Okay, then we're all present. So then we'll move on, members. I'll now ask the parish council representative Helen Davers to speak. You have three minutes in which to address the committee. Good morning. Thank you, Chair. We object to this application, as have 335... Hang on, I'll just, sorry, can you stop the clock? Um, we can't hear you. Can you get either closer to your mic or turn it up? Uh, if you just speak, I can tell you whether we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's lovely. That's okay, lovely. I'm so hunched, we'll start again. <laughs> I'm hunched over the screen. <laughs> okay, <coughs> we object to this as have 335 of our parishioners, plus Burstall, <coughs> Hitcham, Elmset and Bramford Parish Councils. There are a frenzy of applications coming forward along the Gipping Corridor, contributing to an almost continuous ribbon of development along the B Treble 13. They are in addition to the 1200 Wolsey Grange homes, the build out of the old Sugar Beach site, Snoasis, etc. The new draft JLP identifies four residential sites between Sproughton and Bramford, and it looks as though developers are keen to get them approved before the JLP comes into effect. The existing adopted local plan policies should take precedence. It should be noted the emerging JLP allocates only a small portion of this site for development, with 75 dwellings rather than the proposed 105. 
this application meets minimum planning requirements but is not exceptional. The northern village boundary is formed by a collection of listed buildings all set within a special landscape area. This heritage rich rural edge is treasured by the village and has remained untouched for several hundred years. The 2015 Baber Landscape Character Type Report recommends avoiding development on this rolling valley farmland which rises to 35 metres above Sproughton. It would dominate the western skyline at the village, i.e. principal location harm. Pigeon have failed to consider the wider views and setting of the Grade 2 buildings, Sproughton Hall, Tide Barn, All Saints Parish Church, etc., and their interaction across the site with the historic listed buildings in the wider landscape. This site is encircled with listed buildings and provides well-established views from Bramper to Sproughton and vice versa. Historic England in the setting of heritage assets makes clear that having identified assets affected by a development and their significance, it is necessary to minimise harm. This development is the opposite. It will cause substantial irreversible impact harm to the heritage landscape. This development is outside the village boundary and will move us one step closer to a merger with Bramford, i.e. the creeping coalescence that the NPPF specifically warns against. This application is supported by a housing needs assessment completed by Turley in June 2020. Projected housing needs for the Ipswich Fringe over the next 16 years have already been approved and are expected to be built out over the next five years. If you accept this, then it clearly shows there is no need for further new housing in Sproughton, especially on this sensitive site. Traffic volumes along the B1113 are already high. Just look at the videos you've seen. The assessment is ignoring the cumulative effects of other planned developments in Bramford, Pinewood, Copdock, Capel and Great Blakenham. Both NPPF and local policies dictate that development needs to consider provision of infrastructure in order to be sustainable. SCC strategic planning want a master plan so cumulative impacts and needs can be properly assessed. This needs to be done before any more developments get the go ahead. You may think you've heard this before. To a degree you have. This site is beside Hopkins Homes, which has already been be refused twice by yourselves in the recent past. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I'll come to you, Joe, to comment on some of what you've heard at the end after I've asked the members if they've got any questions for the Parish Council representative. Members, have you any questions you wish to? Uh, yes, Councillor Jameson. Uh, yeah, good morning, Joe. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify, are you saying that you're not happy with any development in, in Sproughton going forward? And if no. you are, uh, no, have you got sites? Sorry? No, we're not saying that. Um, but this site is over, going to be overburdened <coughs> with development. It's too, way too much. We've got other sites, sites coming forward in our neighbourhood plan, um, which is reasonably well underway at the moment. And we've also got those 1,200 homes approved, um, well, 475 approved at Wolsey Grange and a further 750 proposed um, as phase two of Wolsey Grange. So there's already a significant number coming forward and there's around 83 applications already approved for dwellings that haven't yet been built. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, Councillor uh, McLaren. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Helen. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm just trying to clarify how often Pigeon um, have consulted either with the parish or with the village have you has there been a lot of conversations or has it just been a one-off meeting no uh, they have consulted with us several times uh, the first time was actually a village exhibition in our type barn and that was actually done after they'd first um, submitted um, to to Baber district council which was slightly odd um, but since then, they have actually met with us several times and we've commented on the application. So to be fair, it is an improvement on what it was. Um, and they have attended our parish council meetings to see if we've had any any questions. Um, but you can see from the number of replies, um, objections registered, there is um, strength, strength of feeling there. They have put some community things in place, which you know are, um, you know, a good thing to put forward. Um, but you're not going to get over 105 developments on a greenfield site that's been there for several hundred, many hundred years, mm -hmm. 
and is integral to the way Sproughton sits within the valley. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Parker. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair, and good morning, Councillor Davis. Um, you mentioned there, oh, sorry, forgive me, uh, you mentioned just there about your own neighbourhood plan uh, at Sproughton. Now, I'm, I'm sure you'll you'll understand that we can, uh, we can the weight that we can give to emerging uh, plans depends uh, upon where they are in the uh, in the system, as it were. So can you clarify um, precisely at what technical stage you are at with your own neighbourhood plan? Well, we've completed our public exhibition, um, which happened post the household survey. So we did the household survey, took the results, uh, pulled them all together, and they've gone into the public exhibition. We're now processing the results of those, and we're starting our first draft, and we're beginning to meet with interested um, landowners. Thank you. No more questions, is there? There's no hands up. Right. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Davis from the Parish Council. Uh, Joe, was there anything you wish to comment on basically what Helen Davis uh, conveyed to us? Um, thank you, Chair. No, I think um, I think the majority of the issues have been covered in the report and um, Councillor Parker just picked up the neighbourhood plan issue um, as well. So that's fine. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, right. So we'll now move to, uh, we have two objectors, Rona Germain and Martin Leatherett to speak. Um, you have one and a half minutes each. I think Rob will uh, come in at the appropriate time and allow the second person to speak. Yep, so, that's fine, uh, Chair. If I could just check, because yep. um, Mrs. German, could you just please confirm that uh, mic check as requested? Yeah. So Good morning. Yep, we can hear you. Um, Good morning, everybody. Which Who wishes to go first, just to check? Ladies first. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Thank you, Chair. That's very generous. Um, my name is Rona German and I'm chair of the Sproughton Working Group and we represent the community in objecting to this application. The planning harm of this and eight more developments in the Five Mile Corridor result in ribbon development along a historic heritage landscape asset, the Gipping Valley. Ultimately, Sproughton will be absorbed into Bramford and this is contrary to the MPPF. The Fitzgerald Road development of 195 dwellings in Bramford is only 512 metres away from this application. The self-built properties that creep up the 35 metre valley side will not benefit the community and local government accrues no SIL payment for these 13 self-builds. They are a cost and a burden to the infrastructure and substantial irreversible impact harm to the heritage landscape. This is the only development on the west side of the parish overlooking the exact same heritage village and its assets for which Hopkins Homes was refused. From the top of the site, you can see Ipswich Hospital, 4.8 miles away. It is the most elevated site in the parish. It holds no benefit to the existing par parishioners as it is socially isolated by Lorraine Way, elevated position, main roads, barrier of the pub, allotments, and means that social cohesion will be poor. On the indicative plan, the agent has had to admit defeat in terms of connection and has put the required Suds Basin as a further barrier. The land slope forces this necessary constraint and re results in disconnection. It is outside the existing village settlement boundary, seeks to develop well beyond the extremity of the JLP recommended site by 7.1 hectares. It is the entrance to our village causing substantial irreversible impact harm to the heritage landscape. Key policies for your that consideration. Time, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you. Martin, Martin Leverett. Yes, thank you. Has my image come up? Yes, yes, I can see you. We can see you. Thank you. All right. 176 years ago to the day on the 7th of October 1844, William Wordsworth wrote, is there now no nook of English ground secure from the rash assault of development? And those stark words are a reminder that a planning committee remains the last gatekeeper for a community that it serves about the future appearances of villagers and their relationship with the surrounding countryside. The weight of objection in this case is represented by 335 letters which oppose the application and the principal objections that conflicts with the core strategy policy and it demonstrates that poor planning decisions remain the invisible enemy to hinterland villages. The application conflicts with core strategy on eight points. The site lies within the Gipping Valley Special Landscape Area 
Secondly, it's outside the village settlement boundary. Thirdly, it concentrates urban density housing beyond the core village and shifts highway problems rather than alleviates them. Fourthly, it causes unnecessary harm to 13 heritage assets, of which a group of eight are grade two listed. Fifthly, a modern development of this size and scale doesn't harmonize with, nor does it enhance the landscape outside the village settlement boundary, and it risks coalescence with Bramford. Sixthly, there are no substantial benefits to the village, to the community, or to the countryside, which outweigh the significant harm caused by the development. Seventh, a CS11 housing need doesn't support the application. And eighthly, as has been said, it's not the right site, nor in the right location, because there are more sustainable sites, as will be identified in the neighbourhood plan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right. Uh, I'll now see, um, let's see if there's any questions for the objectors. Members? No, it's done. Thank you very much. So we can move on. Um, we don't have a supporter, so I'll now ask the applicant to speak, Rob Snowlin. You sir, also have three minutes in which to address the committee. And uh, if you'd like to start, Rob, you'll do the timing. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman and members, for the opportunity to address you this morning. My name is Rob Snowling, and I'm Pigeon's Associate Director with responsibility for this scheme. Our application seeks permission for a high quality, sustainable landscape and design led scheme, as described to you in the case officer's presentation. We've undertaken extensive engagement in developing the proposals for land north of Burstall Lane including a series of meetings with the Parish Council and Sport and Working Group, in addition to two public exhibitions following submission of the original application last year. The amended scheme that is before members adopts a high quality landscape led design approach with extensive areas of green infrastructure, four and a half hectares in total, including a community woodland and extensive tree and hedgerow planting to ensure that the scheme is a positive addition whilst respecting and preserving local heritage assets. Responding positively to community feedback, the scheme has been revised so, the, so that the existing allotments will be retained in their current location and enhanced through the provision of additional plots for both new and existing residents. The provision of a village car park next to the allotments will provide additional off-street parking, which will be connected to the village centre via a new zebra crossing and a three metre shared foot and cycleway, helping to encourage sustainable travel. The foot and cycleway will form part of the green corridor between the rainway to the east and public footpath nine to the west which will provide high levels of connectivity between the new green infrastructure and the village centre. Retention of existing boundary vegetation and new planting will ensure that wildlife corridors are retained and enhanced, whilst ecological enhancements such as bat boxes, hedgehog friendly fencing and log piles will, del will deliver an overall net gain for biodiversity. The scheme will also provide land for community uses, which will provide new employment opportunities and widen the range of services and facilities in the village, in addition to providing energy efficient homes that will meet identified needs through the provision of 37 affordable homes. In addition, the provision of 13 self-built plots, two and three bedroom market homes, plus 10 bungalows will meet the needs of both younger people wishing to stay in the village, as well as the aging population and people with access needs. In order to improve the, lo in order to improve the, the local road network, the scheme will provide a new link road between the rainway and Burstall Lane, which will help to ease congestion by diverting through traffic away from the Wildman Junction whilst also safeguarding land to facilitate the delivery of a future relief road to the west of the village. In addition to the off-site highway improvements that have been agreed with the local highway authority, a comprehensive package of village improvements is proposed. These enhancements will include new village gateway features, new speed limits and weight limit restrictions, improvements to the Wildman Junction, traffic calming measures, passing bays on Burstall Lane and the provision of a bus shelter on the rainway. In conclusion, we acknowledge that the scheme represents change, but firmly believe that its high quality landscape led design provision of new homes, in particular smaller market homes and bungalows, extensive public open space provision, together with a comprehensive package of community benefits, will make a long lasting positive addition to the community of Sproulton. Thank you for your consideration. I'd be happy to answer any questions that members may have. Thank, thank you very much. We have questions from Councillor Hinton. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, yes, uh, my question really is is uh, linked a little bit to uh, previous developments from your company where you've proposed in the outline applications considerable numbers of bungalows and then when it, the 
the site has been sold on to somebody else. Everything seems to change. Within the brochure that you sent round to everybody, you do actually talk about a significant provision of bungalows as part of the scheme's housing mix. What do you regard as significant? Uh, so the, the, the scheme includes the provision of 10 uh, bungalows within the scheme. Um, so that's that's 11% um, of the um, of the overall scheme. Thank you. Perhaps next time you can get a bit Sorry, closer to the I, mic. If I could come back, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Uh, you said 11%. How many houses, total houses are there? 92, isn't it? Oh. Can you answer that? Build sites? Uh, I've got down 92 plus 13 self build, which makes uh, 105. Okay. So, uh, can 10, you hear us, it's Mr. Not 11%. Snowden? Mind you, that's probably yeah, uh, just to clarify um, the the 11 percent. Sorry, is from from the 92, so it excludes the 13 self build, um, for which there isn't a um, a design or a bedroom size that's been specified as part of part of the scheme. So, so yes, you're quite you're quite right. Um, if you take the 10 as as um, a proportion of 105, clearly it's not 11 percent. It would be it would be less. Thank you, Councillor Hinton. Was that it? Yep. Um, Councillor Barrett. Thank you, Chair. I, I was just going to um, raise also the point about bungalows. Um, I wondered if there'd been any discussions with the um, uh, uh, village and the, the parish about um, single storey development. And um, uh, as, as, as we know, that is uh, very, very popular uh, to offer people opportunity to downsize. Um, and I think I, I thought only six were in this development, but I may be wrong. No, there is more. Right. Can you answer that, uh, Mr. Snowden? Yes, of course, Chair. Yeah. Um, so just to clar clarify once again, uh, so there are 10 uh, bungalows included within the overall scheme, mm -hmm. um, of which six of those will be uh, affordable. Um, so six affordable bungalows uh, for market bungalows. Um, and in terms of the bungalow provision, um, yes, that, that's something uh, through the uh, through the community engagement that we undertook. Um, um, at, so two public exhibitions um, where there was uh, support expressed uh, for the provision of bungalows um, within the scheme. Um, so we sought to respond to that um, with the proposed um, housing mix um, that's proposed. Thank, thank you. Is that, is that okay. the question? The, the, the provision of four seems absolutely minimal and and doesn't seem to be a, a good response to um, if if the, the your engagement with the village was was meaningful. I think you might have offered more than that, surely. Can you comment? Um, yeah, yes. Um, so um, the uh, the requirement for. Uh, the bungalows has been driven to some extent by the affordable housing requirement. So um, we, we felt that the provision of 10 bungalows um, was a suitable response to the requirement for that type of accommodation um, within within the scheme. Um, the, um, I, I suppose we, we have over provided um, in terms of bungalow, um, affordable housing bungalow provision um, within the scheme. Um, it's quite unusual uh, for a scheme to include uh, affordable uh, bungalows. Um, we've, we've responded to uh, the requirements from the Strategic Housing Officer um, in, in, in respect of uh, providing precisely the mix uh, that, that will meet uh, lo local uh, needs uh, within, within the scheme. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could I just ask myself, um, could a could a bungalow or bungalows be included in any of the 13 self-built custom built plots Is that uh, a possibility yeah. yes they they could chair uh, i mean and, and, and indeed that's something that we had considered um as part of the development of the scheme um, so they're not excluded that's they're fine not, they're not excluded no correct thank you councillor ayers you're next followed by councillor busby councillor ayers uh, good morning. Um, I'd just like to ask, having um, travelled that road from Bristol down to the Wild Man and left to, um, because I taught for 20 years, 
that road is really quite um, narrow. How soon are you going to actually have the road? Is it prior to the building or what? Could you explain, please? The road improvements. Yeah, so if I could just pick up on, on two points there. So in, in, in response to um, the question about the timing of the delivery um, of the road, um, it's envisaged that that would be brought forward as part of the development. Um, so, so it would be phased to coincide uh, with the delivery of the, the new homes, the community facilities um, as part of the scheme. Um, what we've discussed with the highway authority is um, the phasing and timing of that being controlled via a planning condition. Um, so, so that would be set out as part of the, the overall construction uh, management um, of the scheme. Um, but it's envisaged that um, the Spine Road would be um, pro providing the link between, between Burstall Lane and the Rainway um, would be brought forward as part of uh, the, the overall scheme. Um, just in, ter in terms of um, Burstall Lane and uh, how su suitable it is for, for vehicles to use it, um, we, we picked up on, um, on the need to uh, improve the highway safety uh, position in respect of Burstall Lane and as part of the scheme we're proposing uh, passing bays um, on Burstall Lane that would be delivered as part, part of the scheme um, and we felt that that struck an appropriate uh, balance between um, providing, uh, pr providing uh, an improvement to the safety of vehicles using Burstall Lane but without um, going to the extent of widening the road uh, and poten potentially making it a more attractive route. Uh, um, Clearly, we're not trying to encourage more people to use Burstall Lane. Can I come back there, Chair? Yeah, yeah. Um, can I just say, you need to have um, permission from the landowners for those passing schemes. And surely, knowing that road, it would be the first priority to put that spine road in, because otherwise you're going to have heavy vehicles for the building supply. So really, we do need that quite soon, don't we? Um, if, if I could come yes, back on, I'm waiting for you. Uh, th thank you. Um, so um, construction access, um, it would be envisaged would come would come forward from Lorraine Way. So so there wouldn't be any any construction access um, coming coming from Burstall Lane. Um, so so the existing, um, I think the uh, case officers um, slide showed the access um, to the existing caravan storage area on Lorraine Way. Um, so so that that is the proposed location. Um, of the um, of the fine road where where it would um, access Lorraine Way, um, that it was was the detail of the construction, as I say, would be specified through a construction management plan in due course. Um, it's envisaged that uh, construction access would be provided from Lorraine Way, not from Burstall Lane, um, which is uh, councillor Ayres quite quite rightly suggests um, is not is not a suitable access for uh, construction vehicles. Um, in, in terms of in terms of the passing bays and, and um, our ability to deliver those, um, those are those are proposed um, as part of land that is um, within within the applicant's control. Um, so so it's part it's it's either land that's um, uh, within the applicant's control or within the uh, the highway boundary. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, just following on from that um, question from Councillor Ayres. Uh, if we were minded to approve the application, how quickly would you be on site to start this? Yeah, so um, we've set out a, um, a delivery um, timetable uh, within within the de delivery statement um, that members will have received uh, as part of the br briefing note um, for, for the scheme. Um, and um, we've allowed um, a reasonable lead in time for submission, approval of reserve matters on the scheme um, and uh, discharge of conditions and mo mobilisation to site. Um, and we've suggested that um, we would be on site um, in the mon monitoring year 2022, um, 2023. Right, thank you. Um, Councillor Busby, you are next. Surely, I mean, have you got a, a developer or house builder in mind, or have you got one signed up for it? Um, not, not at this stage. Um, we, we, we talk to a number of house uh, builders, um, uh, as members will be aware. We're, we're, we're involved in a number of schemes, um, both within uh, the region, uh, but also in Baber um, itself. Um, 
and uh, we've had significant interest um, in bringing the scheme forward. Um, its location within the A14 um, is, is clearly a desirable location, um, so, so we, we continue to talk to home uh, builders um, about the scheme, um, and we, we're, we're, we're very com com confident that um, we, we would be able to select a home builder partner here. Um, to bring to bring the scheme forward uh, within the time frame that uh, I, I am at. Okay. Uh, sorry, Peter, yeah. a couple, yeah. couple more questions. If we were to approve this application, uh, but with a condition that you should build the community building rather than just provide a plot of land, would you be acceptable with that? Uh, well, that, that's certainly something um, that we'd considered as part of the um, development of the of the scheme. Um, where we've where we've um, arrived at um, following discussions with uh, the community parish council um, and officers is that um, the, the the permission should remain as a uh, flexible uh, permission, um, so that it allows for um, either community use. Um, either a local shop or office space to be brought forward on that land. Um, and the intention is that that would be secured via the Section 106 agreement. Um, so there would then be a period of time uh, that would be um, uh, set, set aside effect, effectively to explore the uses that could come forward on that site. Um, I think what I would say in respect of um, the land that's been identified uh, for the uses, um, for the community uses, the local shops and the office space, um, is that there, there has been support from the council's economic development team um, in respect of providing some, uh, some modern um, small scale office space um, on, that part of the, on that part of the scheme. Um, and that's certainly um, something that could be brought forward um, if there wasn't a community use um or, 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 or a local shop uh requirement i, I think perhaps you've that. answered that point i'll just ask which might help you councillor busby whether joe hobbs um whether you wanted to comment on that point alone yes no thank you chair um yeah the uh, the space obviously has been intended to be flexible and so um it's uh yeah, we want to make sure that uh, the use that comes forward is the one that's wanted by the community um or needed um by the, the market will deliver and the section 106 agreement will ensure that that site is safeguarded for a period of time um to make to try and enable it to come forward so we'll have a period of time where we've got a sustained marketing strategy for um either retail or an office use um and protect it but obviously we, we can't protect in perpetuity um, if there's no interest in that site coming forwards but hopefully um, with the evidence from economic development team you know there's a there's um there is interest out there but I do take Councillor Busby's point about uh, ensuring a building is actually built on the site um, that is the ideal um, situation it's just we have uh, a difficulty with the um, knowing exactly what that would be because we have the flexibility of different uses um, and so because obviously different uh, different buildings have different specifications and requirements so the scheme obviously it's it's a it's a potential put forwards but I have been careful in the committee report to note obviously it's it's not a significant benefit as there is no um, certainty over its delivery at present um, and um, I'd be I want to kind of guide members to be careful obviously of placing too much weight on that as a benefit for that very reason and and the scheme doesn't hinge on the delivery of those particular uses um, in terms of it being beneficial there are other community benefits which we secure the uh, community woodland the allotments and such like um, that uh, we definitely will have certainty of delivery on um, okay. so um, yeah we 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 have uh, we have investigated and I say the section one of six will um, control the situation to a degree. Thank you. Councillor Vasby, can we move on? No. Um, oh. <laughs> the on. point was, uh, look, I know it, it could be a generic building, which they, they put the shell up. It's a question to the applicant, remember? Yeah. It's uh, a commitment to funding the building. A piece of land is just a piece of land. It's, it's no community benefit, really. They've got plenty of land. It's the cost of putting the building up that they're and looking. What is help. your question to the applicant? Sorry, well, if the if the applicant as part of this uh, doesn't build it, would they be prepared to put a sum aside to enable it to be built in the future? Oh, that's a fair comment, um, uh, Mr. Snowlin. Can you answer that? 
uh, or help. Yes, yes, of course, Chair. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think um, uh, given un unless unless we have an identified use um, for the building, um, I think I don't think we could commit to a sum of money being put aside to bring it forward. That that that's something we could we we could explore um, in due course. Um, I think it's important to note that um, the scheme will deliver the village car park, um, which sits to the south of the uh, the land that's been um, reserved for the community, um, local shop and employment uh, office space use. Um, so, so as part of that village car park being provided, um, there will be um, a private driveway, uh, utilities infrastructure that will be provided to effectively create a service site. Um, I'm sure Thank you. I think you've answered that. Councillor Busby, your yeah. next question. Yeah. Um, the self-build site plots, they look quite large. Uh, they certainly look larger than the average plot size for the development. Um, what would you expect to be built on there? They look at least four bedroom sized plots. Yeah, so the, um, the self-build plots um, are... are typically um, quarter, quarter of an acre uh, plots. Um, they've been designed partly um, to allow uh, for um, a, a, a house of, a between uh, a three or four bedroom house to be delivered um, on, the, on those plots. Um, our experience is that generally people who want to build um, their own home, so people who are looking to, uh, to bring a self-build plot forward, um, generally are looking for um, a detached uh, or looking to build a, a detached home um, and in some ways the, um, the the positioning of the self-build plots has been dictated by uh, the design um, so so the uh, the plots along Burstall Lane um, we've sought to replicate the uh, character um, of the lane so uh, with a new uh, woodland belt that would be provided to the north of Burstall Lane to replicate the southern side of, of the lane um, with a private driveway, uh, which would then access the plots um, to the north yeah. there. Thank okay, you. I mean, it's, I think it's, it's very... Your next question. Well, by leaving these 13 houses out of the market mix, it, it does affect the percentage. It's easy to say that you've got a high proportion of two and three bedroomed houses because you've excluded 13, which are probably going to be four or five. If you include those in, it drops the percentage down. So it's a, you know it's a marketing ploy, isn't it? Um, Your that's question. <laughs> How yeah. dreadful of you to do it, don't you think? <laughs> could I, could I just no, come that's not a question. You don't need to answer that, Councillor. There was a thing uh, at the end. Yeah. Uh, do you have another question for him? Otherwise, I'm going to move on. Uh, just the the new you mentioned new employment opportunities. I just want apart from building the houses, which let's face it, we don't we don't have a problem with putting houses up. Um, what were the employment opportunities that you talked about? So the, um, the land's been um, identified uh, as uh, office space. Um, so so we're, we're envisaging uh, small scale um, office space that would be provided. So creating um, modern office space uh, that would meet the needs of people um, living and working in the village. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Busby. Uh, we now have Councillor McLaren. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Snowlin. Um, the reason I asked the Parish Council a question was how often you had consulted with them. And my concern is that <coughs> when you apply for outline permission, you have a lot, a big, and a credit to your company, a good relationship, or you hope you've got a good relationship with the parishes or the villages that you um, are working with. However, because you work with partner builders, um, when they come to apply for detailed planning permission, as we've heard in the past, that has not always conformed with what you applied for initially. Um, how do you feel about this? Because I think some villages and some parishes are feeling let down by the original uh, outline, in, uh, sorry, the original outline permission, which appeared to respond to their needs and requests. Yeah. How That's do you feel about that? Because it was sold that? on to a third party, 
You're right. Yeah. Can you help uh, that, Mr. Snowden? Yeah, th thank you um, for the question. Um, uh, I mean, I think what um, having having listened to the the uh, planning committee meeting um, where where the scheme in uh, question uh, was um, heard, um, I'm I'm aware of the issues surrounding that scheme, um, and I think um, I, I I would say that that's that's actually an isolated in incident. Um, all of the other schemes that we've been involved with, um, including those within the Suffolk uh, area, have have delivered um, uh, broadly in accordance with the mix that we have we have uh, set out at the outline stage. Um, I think it's unfortunate that in that instance um, that there, there, there wasn't a, a condition um, included on the planning permission, um, and that's certainly um, what is envisaged here that there would be be a planning condition um, to ensure that. Uh, the mix that comes forward at Reserve Matters stage, um, including the provision of the bungalows, um, including the provision of the, of the smaller market homes, um, would actually be delivered uh, substantially in accordance with uh, what's been set out now at this outline stage. And uh, as I say, that's something that as uh, Pigeon are, are completely com comfortable with. Um, we've done that on, on other schemes. Um, so, so, yeah, I, I, I hope that that will assure men members Thank you. That, um, that's a, an exception rather than a rule. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I think this particular planning committee has learned lessons from that particular situation that happened earlier uh, in the year. Um, now, I've got one left and that's um, uh, Councillor Barrett, because we still have the debate to come. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Yes, um, I, I, it's a similar-ish area, but uh, in, in terms of um, Questions to yeah Mr. yeah I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you are. Um, the artist's impression is very influential to me um, because I, I thought it was was good, um, showing what the street scene might look like with the the trees and then showing a maturity as, as it might develop. But I, w I want to know how how realistic that might be. Um, is there a, a a plan for the type of trees and the maturity that that would be uh, provided so that we can have some uh, you know um, we understand that villagers are very concerned about the loss of landscape and things and that would mitigate that somewhat if there's any assurance that you can give on that good question mr Snowden. yeah of course um uh, no th thank you um the uh the visualizations that we've provided with the scheme um, was the illustrative in terms of the building appearance, uh, the the, um, the appearance of the buildings themselves um, will be uh, determined through reserve mass application in due course. Um, the landscape that's been shown um, on those visualisations is based upon the landscape master plan uh, that accompanies the outline planning application. Um, and um, we, we've, uh, we, we, we've discussed the provision of conditions uh, that will be attached to the outline planning permission that will um, ensure that the landscaping is provided um, in accordance with what is shown um, on, on the landscape master plan. Um, the, uh, the visualizations um, in order to, to give, a, give a fair reflection of how, of how the planting will look um, show um, the, the planting when it's um, newly uh, pl planted but also when it becomes fully established as well. Um, so um, it, it envisages the pa passage of time. Um, but in, in terms of, um, yes, pro providing the landscaping, um, as we've shown on the landscape master plan, as we've shown on those uh, vis visualizations, uh, the details of that would be uh, would be secured via planning condition. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Barrett, is that it? Yep. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. There's no other hands up members. So um, I'm going to take it that we've asked all the questions we wish to ask of the agent. So we'll move on. Uh, we now get to the point where we ask the county councillor member, Councillor Christopher Hudson. Uh, you, sir, have three minutes in which to address the committee. And you're very welcome here this morning. No afternoon. It's now 12 o'clock. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for the invitation. And good good afternoon, members, and thank you for the officer's report and presentations. Can you keep uh, nearer to your mic or whatever? Yes, don't we hear Chairman. you nicely? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me now? That's good. 
Uh, my concerns, Mr. Chairman, are based on two main grounds, if I may, this, this afternoon. One is the health and well-being agenda, which I think is very, very important to all of us, particularly the residents of Sproughton. Uh, secondly, the highways, which, is, as you know, Mr. Chairman, is, is one of the competences of the uh, of the division of the county. Really, I think that this uh, parish, Sproughton, has been absolutely overwhelmed in recent years, may I say, with hundreds heading for the thousands of development. I believe that the development on a highways front, and particularly on a health and uh, health and well-being front, is totally unsustainable. I know that we've looked at the amount of traffic going down the, the high street in Sproughton. Tragically, we've had a fatality down there and any number of accidents. Uh, it's really a very, very dangerous bottleneck. Burstall Lane, I know I hear of mitigation that what, what is planned, but with this particular speculative development here, I, I'm, I'm a doubting Thomas, Mr. Chairman. Because I, I, I neither believe it to be sustainable, nor in the interests of the parish. I say that because of the fact that one only has to go up and down the road to Hadley there, and you'll know that better than anybody. It really is a no-go area. They missed out on the boat 20 years ago with a bypass. So the traffic situation, it will really change the relevant nature of the locality. We will move from having a medieval village, a hinterland village, into what is becoming an urban sprawl with toy towns attached to it. And I don't think that's sustainable, Mr. Chairman. We do need to be concerned, particularly in the pandemic, which brings it to a head, that people, people do need to get out into the greenery. They do need fields not only to walk on, they need those fields to provide food as well. And the allotments are close by, we need more land. We need more green spaces for people to grow food and to enjoy themselves. And really, I would invite your committee this, this afternoon, Mr. Chairman, to really bear in mind that from a highways point of view, but more particularly from a health and well-being point of view, this really is a development too far amongst all the other hundreds that we've had. And I would see, say that I go so far as to say this will mark the death knell of Sproughton as we have known it. And it is our duty to heritage to ensure that we keep it safe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Hudson. Uh, members, have you any questions uh, for the County Councillor? Uh, yes, I've got uh, Councillor Hinton followed by Councillor Osborne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Councillor Hudson. Hold on a minute, John. Uh, Councillor Hudson, um, can, can you stay in the meeting, um, put your mic on and your camera on? And um, then uh, Councillor Hinton, lovely. Councillor Hinton, your question to Councillor Hudson. Yeah, question for you, Councillor Hudson. As the County Council are the Highways Authority, and yeah. they have put in effectively um, no comment other than for standard 106 agreements, huh. and also they're talking about gateways on Burstall Lane, which presumably are part of the County Council's highway policy in terms of slowing down traffic through villages. How do you equate that with the eclectic attitude they have to speed entering villages in other parts of the district? And is there any way of us getting any sort of logical comment from highways concerning the problems along there? Because I can remember when Lorraine Way was the bypass effectively for Ip Ipswich before the A14 was built. And then the traffic seemed to seemed to flow reasonably well. Now, if there's a problem on the A14, everything just grinds to a halt. Um, there is no way that uh, the county council's current attitude towards highways can be sustained. And you're effectively endorsing this uh, and saying that, yes, it, it cannot be con um, sustained, but at the same time are not actually questioning the right people, namely your colleagues within the County Council? Yes. Um, one, ha one can question as long as one wants, but because, some, because one can do something doesn't necessarily mean that one should do something. I'm referring, we have a nightmare background here, which is the A14, A12 complex and Cockdock Mill. Now, whilst this is not absolutely material to this application in C2, it is applicable 
to the overriding amount of traffic that is whizzing up and down the A12 and across the A14. I don't necessarily feel sorry for colleagues in the highways, but I think when one looks at what has been allowed with developments in the past, and we're looking at what the highways have allowed, they are unsustainable. It's, they've allowed far too much traffic to flow through totally unsuitable streets. Really, Mr. Chairman, some of those thoroughfares are no more than cattle tracks. Cattle, they are just byways. And the amount of work that's going on to do this, it's unsustainable. And I, I, I'm, as I say, I'm a doubting Thomas, and I will even question my officers at highways, that perhaps they're not as close to the spot. And like any human being, they can make mistakes. So this is a big one. Thank you. Councillor Hinton? No, he's gone, right? Councillor Osborne? Sorry, Mr Chairman, I'll take oh. my hat down. Right. Councillor Osborne? Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Y yes, um, uh, Councillor Hinton has, has, has broached on, on the area that I was going to ask. Uh, can I can, can continue? Yep. yep. Has broached on the uh, uh, s stuff that I was going to ask Councillor Hudson about. The one thing that I'm astonished by is you are, you talk about the well-being and you talk about green space, and there and there we have Suffolk County High, County County Highways and Highways England having no objections to this. All I seem to see from this uh, application on on highways grounds is that you've moved one lot of uh, congestion to another and Burstall Lane will become a, ra a rat run and that will then pick up on that uh, A133, uh, 113, sorry. Um, also, um, the the situation with cycle route and and the footpath, does, does that mean that your footpath and cycle route are going to continue down and, and onto the 113? How are you going to pick up a cycle route down there? I wouldn't like to cycle down there for one moment, but, uh, you know, I would have expected um, a, a Suffolk County councillor uh, dealing with uh, a, an area that he is involved with to have asked the questions, why have they have they made any considerations about the congestion that you're always going to get down there? Thank you. You're, thank you, Councillor Osborne. You are pushing at an open door. I have made such representations. I will continue to make such representations, but I'm not an officer of the county. And of course, they have acted in very good faith and they've acted very professionally. All I say as the elected member of the constituents in this division is we do not want this development. It is unsustainable from a highways point of view. I differ from the officers and I'll continue to differ. And I agree with you, Councillor Osborne. It's a nonsense and I'm very frightened for cyclists. And of course, this isn't the only site where this is a problem. But I do applaud the green or quiet lanes policy that's coming in. That is a very good factor. But as regards the parish of Sproughton, far too much development, too quickly, with not enough highway provision and not enough health and wellbeing provision. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I think it's fair to point out to both Councillor Osborne and, and to support Councillor Hudson uh, that the um, highways department are the experts that we have to consult as planners as a planning authority and they come back after they've made their investigations or views or uh, deliberations and make an opinion which they feel they can uphold um, so it's very difficult for uh, county councillors or, or anybody to challenge these they are the experts and whilst i don't like it we do have to live with that um, so Anyway, we now have um, Councillor Barrett followed by Councillor Parker. Councillor Barrett, your question to Councillor Hudson. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, good morning. Uh, good afternoon, Councillor Hudson. Um, you will be aware of the uh, improvements that are proposed at the roundabout um, near Woolsey Grange um, that haven't yet been delivered, have they? Um, I, I think it's been called delayed by COVID. I think it was due to, right. to start work earlier. But that will no doubt improve uh, the flow of traffic into Ipswich from Hadley direction. And it may well have a, a, a beneficial effect on the village of Sproughton because the 
you know, if you're choosing which way to go into Ipswich, you might choose the, the upgraded um, route instead of cutting through. Do, do you do you think that will benefit Sprout and and, um, and and therefore, you know, the the catastrophizing that we're we're doing at the moment about what um, what traffic could be might might not be as bad as as we believe. Th th thank you and good afternoon, Councillor Barry. Um, you make a reasonable point that we may well expect an improvement or at least a mitigation if those things go ahead. There's no guarantee of that, of course. The amount of people drifting into the Ipswich area and the coalescence of those parishes into the greater Ipswich area, the amount of traffic is phenomenal and the attendant pollution. Now, one could also say down the track, we could well get more and more electric cars and less pollution and it will be easier for traffic to go. If you were to ask me this morning on this particular application, I would say the effect of this development will be very detrimental and it could be years and years down the track. Who knows with this terrible COVID and the economic consequences of it, we may be lucky to even buy a push card in the future because everybody, as you know, is running out of resources, what we used to call money in the old days. So I think, yes, I'm optimistic that we may get improvements, but my word, I wouldn't like to hold my breath. Thank you. Uh, I think, Councillor Barrett, in answer to a part of your question regarding the Wolseley Grange uh, Road improvements, uh, they were, as I think you're aware, meant to start in early April and then they got uh, stopped because of the culvert. Um, but since then, I have asked our officers to pursue with the applicants as to why they can't get it underway while there's less traffic on the road and less people to be inconvenient. And I'm afraid the replies I've got, I think, have just been excuses. Uh, they say on safety grounds, um, but uh, they are due to happen at some point in time. Yeah, That's all I yeah can tell you. I'm sure. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Parker, your question to Councillor Hudson. Thank you, Chair. And it's a very, very quick question. Um, uh, good afternoon, Councillor Hudson. I, I think in your response to Councillor Osborne, you summed it up a treat, Mr Hudson, when you said that you simply don't want this development. Do you accept that this planning committee cannot determine an application based on the fact that it doesn't want this development? Uh, the, the discretion of your committee should never be fettered. It will, it will only decide things on planning matters but at the end of the day, it's not that I don't want it for any unspecific reason. I don't want it for uh, highways reasons and health and well-being reasons. It is both unsustainable, it's unrealistic, and I do not want uh, a toy town add-on that's an ungoable situation, unviable as regards the road structure in what is a rural setting. So only on planning grounds, I have no vote in this, as you know, Mr Chairman, but I believe it to be unsustainable for the reasons I've given. It's not a predilection against planning applications. I try to approach logic when I decide. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Parker. Uh, Councillor Busby, you're the last hand I've got up to Councillor Hudson. Yes, pro it probably shouldn't be to Chris, really, because I don't think you can answer it, but and probably to Joe, but just... The report well, seems to suggest... your mind. This is a question to Councillor Hudson. You're more than capable of putting it to him if you wish. If he can't answer it, then I'll see if Joe can. OK. Um, are the highways team capable of joined up thinking? Bearing in mind that in this report, they seem to suggest that the there will be improvements to the Beagle roundabout. But my understanding is that in Wolsey Grange development coming forward, they're going to turn it into a traffic lights. Good afternoon, Dave. Um, Hi, Chris. Of course, of course, they're capable of joined up thinking, but sometimes they don't achieve it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for that one, Councillor Hudson and Councillor Busby. Uh, there's no other hands up. So um, with that, then I'm going to move on. Thank you, Councillor Hudson, Suffolk County Councillor for the area. Um, right, we now move to the ward member. And it's Councillor Sack Norman. Uh, you have five minutes uh, in which to address the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Afternoon, even. Yes, good morning, everybody. And thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, 
before I begin to discuss the reasons um, why, because I've I've agreed with um, all the speakers so far. Um, Chris, thank you very much. You've made some great points there. Um, there are many policy reasons why this should be refused, but I just wanted to take the opportunity to mention the community discord around this application. Uh, the community, ever since hearing about this application, has been very unsettled, and if it was to be approved, it would set quite a dangerous precedent and could ruin what many people actually love about the village and why they moved here in the first place. There are over 300 objections on this application, and they aren't only from parishioners in our area, uh, but also from further afield in Bursal, Elmset, Rantford, Hintlesham, Chattersham and Copdock and Washbrook. And this is because of the detrimental cumulative impact that this application would cause to the area. As has been touched on already, uh, a huge issue with this application is the traffic issue. Uh, I personally live on Sport and High Street, so I know the traffic issue all too well. Um, going to work and coming home every morning is an absolute nightmare with all the traffic congested uh, up to the Beagle roundabout in both directions. The proposed spine road won't help to ease this congestion at all. It would simply move it to another junction. Um, and most people who use the Wildman Junction are either going straight ahead to go towards Ipswich or are turning right. The majority of people that are using that when they're coming to and from work aren't going to be turning left to go to Brantford or Claydon, which is the only circumstance where the spine road would actually improve the situation. Um, most And most of Sportland's traffic problems have their roots in the fact that the Comptock interchange doesn't work anyway. So anything that's actually done in the village to try and improve congestion won't actually achieve anything because our routes are very deep rooted in the Cop Dog Interchange of why the traffic in Sporton is so bad. Um, Sporton is currently in the process of carrying out a neighbourhood plan, as was touched on earlier. Um, this plan is being carried out by members of our community and is in the gather evidence phase. Uh, this is expected to come to fruition at the end of 2021 and has already performed a site allocation. Um, from the household survey, there is 31% of our local communities that state um, there are many different factors that oppose the wet, uh, development behind the wild man, such as the positive features of Sproughton being open and green fields, local wildlife and habitats, as well as the negative features being highlighted as the volumes and speeds of traffic and pedestrian safety. So by, by approving development behind the wild man, it would simply remove what the residents love about the community and enhance everything that we hate. The community have highlighted that in their response that 50 to 100 homes are needed in the parish of Sproughton in the next 20 years. We've already had 30 homes built in Church Lane and further to that, another 475 approved on the Wolsey Grange 1. So that's at least 505 and Wolsey Grange 2 is also expected to come forward for another 1,000 or more, which goes well above and beyond our proven local need. Another section of the household survey mentioned the natural environment and over 80% of respondents said that our housing needs should not take priority over the local environment. 99% of respondents said that our peace and rural quiet is important and over 94% of respondents said that our history and built heritage is important. If the development of these 105 houses were to go ahead, it would simply destroy our natural environment. Sproughton does not have, as a village, doctors, dentists or other public services. And any new residents on a development of this size wouldn't, be, wouldn't have access to these services without having to drive a car. Therefore, increasing pollution, traffic and ruining the standard of living for those that are living here. In the this lake, uh, Associates visual impact assessment that was submitted with the application. It states that the sensitivity of this area lies in its produced valley slopes, which provides setting to the village edge. It has a simple and open character, which allows long views out to the northwest, contained and fringed by woodlands on the skyline. The only built form in this area is the Wild Man pub, which sits on the bottom of the valley on a staggered crossroads, backed by allotments to the northwest, and the valley side is open and highly sensitive to development. Any development on this special landscape area, which you would have seen from the views and the videos that you've seen, would ruin our views and also impact the visual, the visual impact of the Wild Man pub, which is a grade two listed building. This application has no public benefit to the village other than clear policy requirements with any consideration to the community or the surrounding area. In order to comply with the settlement pattern policy, which is CS2, this development would have to be specially designed to fit into the area. However, this is being ignored due to the visual impact from the wild man listed building, creeping coalescence with neighbouring villages such as Brantford and Claydon, also merging us with Ipswich, and it does not comply with less than substantial harm. Also, as from the attachment yesterday from Robert Hobbs, we also have a five year land supply without this application. In terms of policy, CS2, CS15 for sustainable development and CS11 are being contradicted. Our strategic policy, SPO8, is being contradicted in terms of infrastructure provision. 
and the local policies LP16 for environmental protection, particularly where it talks about agricultural land in paragraph 1A and 2A, and also LP30 for safe, sustainable and active transport, and also LP01 for hamlets and clusters of development in the countryside under paragraph 3, and LP18 for landscape. That whole policy is in contradiction if this development was to go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, uh, Councillor Norman. Uh, members, have you any questions to Councillor Norman? Yes, Councillor Busby. Yeah, hi, Zach. Um, just a thought in terms of this, the timing of this application. We know that the Hopkins Home one is up for appeal. Mm -hmm. If it gets the go ahead mm. in appeal, how much would that change the villagers views of this particular development because the view from a lot of the listed buildings would change significantly. Mm. No you're quite right well if it was going to be both of them going ahead you've obviously got to think of the cumulative impact from both of those anyway and in terms of the views if Hopkins Homes was approved then obviously you've got to think of the views from the All Saints Church and the listed buildings in that area but regardless of that if that was approved the wild man public house is the one that would be most affected by this development and that with Hopkins Homes it wouldn't particularly change the setting so much of the wild man but mm. from this development being directly behind it it would hugely disrupt the setting of that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? There's no hands up. Thank you Councillor Norman then we'll move Thank on. Thank you. Um, we have the second ward member, Councillor Hardacre. Uh, you sir, also have five minutes in which to address the committee. Sorry, Chair. Councillor Hardacre isn't here. Um, oh. He declined the meeting. That was in anticipation if he was here on your script. Apologies. Oh, okay. Thank you. OK, so we haven't got Councillor Hardacre. Sorry, um, can I just check, Chair. Have we got anything in writing from Councillor Hardacre instead of him being here in person? Not to my knowledge, Councillor. Not, not oh, that I've received either, no, Mr. Robert. Prey. Fair enough, thank you. Okay. No, Chair, have... sorry, can I just come in? It's Joe. Um, Councillor yeah. Hardacre did forward um, a comment, um, some comments to me saying uh, he um, supported the parish council and um, Councillor Norman's comments. I, I did refer to that in my presentation, so yeah. I've given a verbal update of his comments that he submitted on the application, just for just for information. Thank you very much. We'll note that. Thank you. Right, members, then I'll now open it up for debate. So, um, oh, Councillor Parker, well done. You can start. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, right, if I could, um, could I just ask a question of uh, Joe, or a couple of questions, please, <coughs> of Joe, just for clarification um, purposes. Um, sorry, Chair, I've got, um, uh, I think Mark Russell has just interjected. Do you want to take that? Uh, th thank you. If that's OK with you, I will take it. Uh, Mark? Um, yes, I'm, I'm yeah. sorry, Chair. I had my hand up. I didn't want to interject and interrupt, but I just thought before the debate started. Yeah, happen. can you hear me OK? Yes, yes, you carry right. on. Yeah, I just want to clear up one or two points. Um, th just, just to re-emphasise, as you've already done, Chair, because we went back to it again, the Highway Authority didn't object. I know, but we went back to that after you made your point. I just want to clarify Mm -hmm. No um, harm was identified, substantial harm, which would result in, in a, a refusal. So we heard what the county councillor said, but we, we can't really go there with the highway reasons for refusal. So I'm sure we all knew that anyway. Um, councillor Norman mentioned the neighbourhood plan, which had been mentioned earlier, that the weight it carries is, is very limited at the moment. It's very early in its process, so we can't really afford that any weight. Um, and the other two points relate to the lessons we learnt with um, Klondike. Um, jo Joe's already given some, some some long answers on this, but I think having discussed this with her, we probably need to revisit the condition relating to the two and three bedders and also the issue of bungalows. So if I may, can Joe just have the, the mic again and explain how we're going to deal with that and then that will inform the debate and therefore the resolution. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and before I lose you, Mark, can you... Um, uh, I can't see your hand for whatever reason. Um, okay. So if you do it again, you'll have to interrupt me, okay? Chat box, yeah, that's fine. Chat box, yeah, then that way I'll know. Thank you. Joe? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, uh, as I alluded to earlier, the housing mix, the number of bedroom sizes, we've got a condition, but we can um, add some words to say the housing mix shall predominantly be two and three bedroom, but we do need to um, obviously be flexible. So I think we need to have a uh, wording in the condition to say, unless in the reasons justification 
is given otherwise, um, because if there's new housing um, evidence in our Shmar, obviously we'll want to reflect that. Um, but uh, yeah, we certainly can add that wording to the housing mix condition. So we'll, we'll um, if my, members are minded to um, go with the recommendation, then we can add that in. Um, with regarding uh, bungalows, obviously um, we've got um, up to 10 bungalows indicative at present. If the number of uh, dwellings produces on site, we can't get 105 in, um, it may be that one of the affordable bungalows doesn't come forward. So again, I think we, we will have, we will look to secure up to 10 bungalows and uh, we'll be very clear that obviously this is a key um, part, if members are minded to, uh, a key part of the members' resolution. Um, and again, if it's not possible to provide up to 10 bung uh, bungalows, then a reason justification must be given. Mm. So we're doing all we can do. We can't at this stage um, definitely secure the 10 bungalows. I think that's the point I want to get across to members, but we can do everything we can to raise it to a future developer of the site that this is a matter of importance for the committee and that they need to provide a, a good reason justification if that changes at the reserve matters stage. Now, with the bungalow um, um, issue, I, I wouldn't, it would be good if we could have uh, potentially the opportunity to, be to secure it by condition or section 106. We just need to get some further, have some further discussions or legal advice on that matter. But we would look to secure it through either one of those routes. And so uh, that's something else perhaps we'd want to note um, with the resolution um, if, uh, yeah, if members are minded to go with it. So hopefully, hopefully that's sufficient. Thank, thank you. Yes, that's certainly a lot stronger um, than what um, and picks up all our points, I think. Um, right. Councillor Parker, back to you. Super job. Thank you, Chair. Um, right. Yes, Joe. So uh, I was I was going to say um, Councillor Davis in her presentation uh, to committee mentioned two points that I just uh, wanted to find and have your comments on. <clears throat> the first one was uh, the 2015 landscape report uh, and Councillor Davis mentioned that um, as a result of that report, Baber considered that this site uh, wouldn't uh, wouldn't be an appropriate site to bring development forward on. So if I could have your comments on that. And then secondly, she mentioned about creeping coalescence. A number of speakers have, have talked about that, but creeping coalescence uh, that is not in accordance with the uh, NPPF. So um, she has a fair point there, doesn't she? Joe? Sorry, Joe, you're muted. You're, Sorry. You're, 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 you're unmuted. You <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. Um, yes, the 2015 um, study um, that was referred to uh, is a, a piece of evidence um, that has looked at the site um, and identified that it does have sensitivities, um, which this planning application has also identified heritage um, landscape sensitivities. Um, but the, the planning application uh, obviously looks at uh, wider matters than just the evidence that the purposes that that report was written for. Um, we need to look at all the material considerations, the um, requirement to consider heritage and landscape harm, but then throw it into the planning balance and consider um, whether the a development would be acceptable under our development plan and the MPPF. So it is a piece of evidence and I believe it is reflected in the findings of this application, uh, the constant comments that we've received and hopefully in the committee report that there are harms associated with this site, but that report in itself doesn't mean in planning terms that we can just say no to this development. We have to consider the development plan and MPPF material considerations. Um, with regard to settlement coalescence, that's something certainly something that we've considered with the landscape impact um, to the landscape visual impact assessment. So we looked at uh, thought considered coalescence with um, Bramford, um, but also Burstall, because obviously it kind of sits um, um, nearer two other development areas. We consider that there is still sufficient um, uh, visual and physical separation with the proposed development, particularly with the revised scheme that has come back down the valley side, so it's not so prominent um, within the landscape. There's still sufficient uh, separation, so there wouldn't be that physical um, coalescence with um, either of those two communities. Um, and so we don't consider that is a, a strong reason that could be used to refuse the application. We consider it is acceptable in those landscape terms. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Parker. Um, and any any other member wish to make comment? No one. Uh, Councillor Busby. Yeah, loads of comments to make, actually, Chair. But uh, mm. the first one really is is the timing of this application that concerns me really. When you think that we, with the JLP, it's based over what a 20-year, 25-year plan, 
Mm-hmm. And we've got to de- deliver these, this level of housing over that period. It doesn't all have to be delivered in year one. I mean, we haven't even started the blimmin' thing yet. And we've already achieved huge percentage of that housing need in Sproughton. They've already allocated, what, 1,200 houses, if not more, of it. How many houses do you need now in Sproughton? And I think the answer is none. So if this come forward in, say, 10 years' time, I think it would be more justifiable. Equally, it, I'm suspicious that it's been brought forward now before the JLP has been totally approved because the number that they've applied for is 40% higher than what's in the JLP. I don't know why. I mean, I'm a suspicious type of person. I, I just think that it's obviously a greater benefit to have 105 houses on a site rather than 75. And then there's the appeal. It, it, again, it just seems strange for us to make a decision based on on this one now when there's an appeal on the site, the other side of the road, which I think will will have, I know what Zach says, but I think will have a material impact on the way that this committee should decide on this one. If the appeal is upheld so that they get approval, that could make a big difference to the way we think. But if the appeal is thrown out on heritage grounds, again, I think that will make a difference on how we would approach this one. So at this point, I'm I'm almost minded to uh, propose a deferral, but I'll let the debate continue before I make that. Thank you. Uh, well, I just have to remind we have to deal with what's in front of us and we have to deal with it on the policies that we have that are up to date and with us at this present time. Um, but Councillor Parker, you wanted to come back, followed by Councillor Barrett. Um, yeah, thank you, Chair, because um, I, I, I kind of sense that actually of, of all debates, this this one was probably going to go in, in, in a certain direction that Councillor Busby has just, just pointed to, actually. Um, and I think we would probably need to take some advice again from our officers, because a simple search of the MPPF shows that paragraph 50 um, deals with prematurity in, in decision making and refusal of planning permission on grounds of prematurity will seldom be justified where a draft plan has yet to be submitted. So I think it's a bit... Uh, it's unfortunate, uh, and I understand where Councillor Busby is coming from, but on what on what planning grounds around the JLP, the forthcoming JLP, could we possibly uh, choose to refuse this application? Mark and Ian, can can you between you um, pick up these points that Councillor Busby and Councillor Parker have just highlighted? Um, I'm sure Mark Mark should go first. I'll help if need be. But thank you, Mark. Right, I'm here. So the question is, can we defer this uh, or even refuse it because it's premature in relation to the JLP? Is that the question that's been asked? Yep. Um, well, 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 no, we can't because um, it's we, we can't do that. We've got to we've got to treat things as per the um, the current set of policies, uh, as I think you've just said. Um, jo- Joe Hobbs can tell you some more about this, if that's okay. Yeah, and I just, just I agree strongly with Mark, not yeah. much else I can say. Over right. to you, Joe. Thank you. Uh, Joe. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yes, um, obviously um, the Joint Local Plan is at an early stage um, in development at present, which is why I didn't uh, particularly labour on it in the presentation, and it's clear in the committee report that we can't place significant weight on that at present. Um, but I, I, I take Councillor Busby's point that we should wait to see where this goes and the appeal site goes. Um, but unfortunately, um, particularly the joint local plan, we can't um, seek to defer because our plan isn't um, quite at that right stage yet. We are under um, the requirement from government to progress applications in a timely manner and determine them under the current development plan, as, as Mark has said. Um, and so unfortunately, um, we 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 are under the onus from central government to progress planning applications as quickly as possible, particularly in the last few months, to try and stimulate um, economic uh, growth where possible. Um, but we have to look at: Are there any reasons here before us today that this planning application should be refused? That is the question that I, w- I would advise members to consider. Um, not that we have a, a pending appeal. 
um, or a joint local plan emerging, I think they, they are um, dangerous grounds to be uh, refusing planning applications on, um, potentially um, deferring applications on as well. We, uh, we are under the requirement to progress applications um, as we can now. Hopefully that answers the question. Councillor Parker. Sorry, can I come back in there, Chair? Uh, yeah, um, I've got you. Just, but I, I was sorry, just, Lee, just to he, pick up Mark's posed, point. Sorry, he posed the question uh, to the officers, so that's why I'd come back to him first. Councillor Parker. And I would just, I would just very quickly say, Chair, that 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 um, that sort of confirms my my line of thinking uh, on that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Busby. Well, thank you, uh, Mark. You said that we can't. Right. use the uh, JLP policies because it's not been approved yet. Therefore, the current policies are the ones that we have to judge it by, which is yeah. fine. Mark. So CS2, therefore, is important because this is a site outside the village boundary. And therefore, this will only be permitted in exec exceptional circumstances subject to a proven justifiable or justified need. Now, I think that's a very important sentence right. because yeah, I'm not convinced uh, that they've uh, proved exceptional circumstances or that there's a proven justified need. And I need to be commit, uh, convinced of that yeah, before I can vote for it. Yeah. That's a sage uh, point Mark, based on what I said. So, I, yeah, I accept why you said that. Obviously, we're talking about saved policies um, and CS2 is just about holding up, but on its own has been proven appeal after appeal uh, not to be a determinative policy in its own right. So you then have to look at all the other policies as well. So CS2 on its own cannot be a reason for refusal or deferral here. Um, and may I, whilst I've got the microphone, Chair, I, I just in terms of the issue of timing the application, um, it was submitted in February 2019. So it's, it's it's been a long time. It wasn't submitted to try and play the, the JLP. It just happens to be here now with us today. That Thank, you. Thank you. I've got Councillor Barrett followed by Councillor Hinton. Councillor Barrett. Thank you, Chair. Um, just looking at the arguments against approval um, that we've heard, highways, it, this completely ignores the improvements that are going to happen at the Woolsey Grange um, sort of uh, effect. Um, of the, I think it's the Beagle Roundabout um, and, our, and along, along that stretch. Um, and yes, on, on the accumulative arguments, um, Woolsey Grange is... Uh, has planning permission for a large number and, and perhaps more, but it just happens to be in, in Sproughton. It's rather different to many other villages where you would see the the development coming alongside. It's it's actually uh, butting up against pine wood. Um, if the boundary was drawn any differently, you can imagine it, it not being in, in Sproughton. I don't think that we could really take that as a cumulative effect on the village of Sproughton. It, it, it has, it will have a, a huge effect on the, the Ipswich fringe, but I don't believe it will on Sproughton. Um, I, I don't see the, the grounds for refusal really. Um, the, it, the sustainability argument is, is I think that that's, pretty established that there are jobs locally there are amenities nearby there are good transport links with the a14 you know we haven't heard a lot about those because because they are they are pretty established they they are um on the doorstep um and i i i'm just i you know i've, I've listened to the officer's argument about um cs2 um and so i'm i'm you know i'm having to accept that basically as a as a valid argument um i don't really see the grounds for refusal i'll leave it there for the moment thank you councillor hinton thank you mr chairman well on what councillor barrett's just been saying well one of the grounds that besides uh, cs2 of course is cs11 where the officers have already admitted that they haven't put in a housing needs requirement um, that meets the, the criteria of CS11. And I'm sure that if that is expanded to actually include Woolsey Grange as part of Sproughton, which it is, whichever way you look at it, um, then uh, there is no need. Also, if you add into that the results of the, the recently, well, yesterday, uh, released AMR, 
which shows that we're sitting at the moment, or, or rather developers are sitting on 4,417 permissions that they haven't even started on yet. Uh, and here we are talking about giving even more permissions. We also know that this particular developer has a, uh, a record, if you like to call it that, of putting in an application which sounds very good and is very difficult to refuse as an outline and includes some fairly bland statements about bungalows, affordable housing, etc. But when you look at the information that the proposers got, got in the report, it talks about most of those affordable houses being in blocks of one bedroom flats. Well, doesn't that sound a bit familiar when you think about Klondike, where all over half the affordable houses were in one particular block of flats? Uh, then you add into that the environmental impact of everybody getting onto the A12 and going somewhere. Because the one thing that we haven't got in Ipswich is a surfeit of employment. That's one of the things we haven't got. We're going to see some new jobs in the Amazon depot at uh, on the sugar beet factory site, but all of the jobs in the main food warehousing uh, site were transferred from other locations across the eastern region really so they weren't actually new jobs at all they were just moved in from somewhere else uh, and if we add into that the MPPF talks about not joining up communities uh, I'm sure that uh, Councillor Barrett would be uh, receive a fairly frosty reception from people in Sproughton if they said that they ought to be, because they lived in Wolsey Grange, they ought to be part of Pinewood, um, because many a village around the outside of urban areas has been swallowed up and disappeared from sight, and they resent it. We should re respect the fact that they are um, independent uh, communities and look after them in that respect. So we've got highways where we don't get any support from them at all because I sometimes wonder whether they actually come out of their office and see what's going on anywhere. Um, they talked in my village about widening up the aspects into the village to slow down the traffic. Here they're talking about putting a gated approach to the village to slow down the traffic. Now they've got their act to get, get their act together and decide what, what the policy actually is. And the MPPF, of course, is uh, it's a valid document whether we like it or not. But both copies of the MPPF, both the original and the latest version, talk about maintaining the identity of individual communities and not joining them up together. So I think we've got sufficient reasons there, to, uh, including the landscape ones, to actually uh, refuse this. And also, of course, if you think about the landscape one, the indicative plans of what a tree looks like in five years time, that's assuming it's growing like a rocket because looking at the size of those trees at the start and the size they were supposed to be in five years time, they'd have to be on something pretty marvelous in the ground to make them grow that quick. Not even a conifer would get that height that quickly. Thank you. Um, Joe, can you comment um, on the pint to Councillor um, Hinton, the, the pint CS11, um, because you did have some concerns, but is there enough concerns there to wait and support a refusal? I think that's what you were suggesting. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yes, indeed, my uh, conclusion to my committee report did note there is tension with CS11. The, uh, the proposals broadly comply with the policy in many aspects, but there is tension with regard to local housing need. It doesn't fully demonstrate the uh, required requirements of CS11, but um, as my uh, conclusion notes, the, uh, the consideration of the application is obviously wider. We need to look at the benefits of the scheme and also the requirements of material considerations, the MPPF, to boost our land supply. And when considering the benefits, the location, all the benefits I've listed before, I won't go through them again, mm. um, that is considered to form a, a, a good material consideration that supports approval of the scheme and uh, the refusal of the um, application on the grounds of uh, not fully uh, addressing housing need on CS11 alone. Um, I don't consider that would be um, upheld at appeal. Um, so my advice is that this scheme should be approved even with that conflict with CS11. Thank you. There isn't the weight there, in your opinion. Mr Chair, Councillor if, Parker, I could, you were next. if I could come back on that, Mr Chair. Um, sorry, sorry, Councillor Parker, I will let Councillor Hinton um, just respond to that. Uh, with all due respect to Joe, she talks about tension here. Um, the 
the latest planning consultation from central government talks about discretion as being part of the decision making in planning. And surely this is where we should use our discretion and say it doesn't comply with CS11. Go away and sort it out properly, because that's one of the things that they can do with a refusal is go away, sort out the reasons that we put forward for refusal and then come back. But if we approve, we're saddled with it. We can't do anything about it. We're stuck. Uh, can, um, so, um, Joe Hobbs, can you can you respond to that? Um, yes, yeah, I, I do take your point, Councillor Hinton, um, that uh, the requirement to demonstrate uh, CS11, but I, I can only say what my advice was, that I don't think that that's a strong reason that will withstand appeal um, with, in line with other current appeals that we have had decisions on. Um, I don't think the Council would win uh, an appeal on that matter with this application, with the other benefits that this scheme delivers. I think that's all I can advise you, unfortunately. Thank you. Sorry, Councillor Parker, it is you now. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. And, and actually, the conversation has moved on quite a bit because um, I, I just wanted and, and thank you, Joe, for, for clarifying, because it it, um, it confirms uh, one of the points that I was going to make. And, and I think, Chair, I, you know, I've got some real sympathy um, and empathy with with the points that, that Councillor Hinton has, has brought up there. Uh, and, and he mentions uh, about us, um, you know, defending villages, etc. And, and, and of course, that is what we're here for as elected representatives and 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 of course it i i, I mention again about the neighborhood planning um, process and and uh, and within the neighborhood planning process of course lies the, the 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 perfect tool for this committee to uh to be able to defend um uh, communities if that's the word that we want to use unfortunately here it is a point of fact we've already mentioned that the jlp uh, has limited weight <clears throat> unfortunately the neighborhood plan uh, has even less weight uh, by virtue of, of of where it is in in the plan process at the moment and and i'm i'm reminded of a a, a planner many years ago who said it's always darkest before the dawn uh, and, and and what he meant by that is is that um un unfortunately until that neighborhood plan is progressed to a certain stage um it's going to be really difficult for us as as a planning committee to be able to uh, to refuse so so really my question was going to be to councillor hinson in response to him as much as i i uh, from a sentimental point of view, as much as I support what he's saying, he will know and every member of this committee will know only too well that we are bound uh, by planning laws that we have and, and the local plan that we're, we're dealing with at the moment. Um, so the question is, is are the are the items that Councillor Hinton is describing as as means of uh, of refusal um, are they robust or or are they tenuous? And and Joe has then gone on, in my opinion, to explain that actually that they 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 would unfortunately be uh, of of a tenuous nature. And how will that stand up um, at appeal? Um, so uh, rhetorical questions there, um, Chair. And I, I know I can't see anybody else has got their hands up. So um, I'm just hoping that was going to uh, invigorate some further debate, Chair. <laughs> Uh, well, there is one hand up. That's Councillor Busby. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> You're more than welcome, Councillor Busby. Uh, there isn't going to be one aspect here that is going to determine whether we should turn it down or not. It's again, it's like a, all these things. It's subjective, isn't it? It's you've got to weigh up the the balance of the benefits and the harm, and. To me, I, I try and do that for each one, and you, it's like a, a seesaw, really. On the on the benefit side, what are the benefits? Well, really, it's only about having a hundred houses. That's it. There's nothing special about these houses. They're not particularly environmentally friendly. It's just basically a hundred houses. Do we really need a hundred houses? Not especially. Not especially there. So there's no particularly fantastic benefit from it but the harm when you look at the individual things that i think it does mount up i mean if we take the listed buildings i remember an application we had in chilton where the chilton hall was 300 meters from a particular site the only thing you could see was the top of the chimneys yet there was a huge fuss about the harm to the chilton hall and here we are in sproughton with what a dozen or more listed buildings all within sight of this application and we're ignoring the harm that's being done to them well i don't i think that's significant once you build on that site that view to the village has gone forever 
Now, we again, we had this issue with in Kersey, where a field which couldn't be seen from six cottages was deemed to be significantly important. Six cottages for a view of a field that couldn't be seen. Here we have a whole village that has a view onto the rolling hills and a number of listed buildings. That should be significant, far more significant than the ones that we've had in Chilton and in Kersey. So you can't negate that loss of view. Sticking trees up doesn't change the fact that the view's gone. Okay, it might be still green, but it's the wrong kind of view now. It's houses and trees. And if you took the view from the public footpath nine, if you walk along public footpath nine now, as you saw from the slides, you've got a fantastic vista right across the valley, right into the other side of Ipswich. That's going to go because all you'll see are trees and houses. And that is significant. And we make the decision to build these houses now and the, that view and the landscape has gone. And I think they're significant pieces of harm and they should, I think, negate the minor benefits we get from 100 houses. 100 houses, remember, of which we don't get sill on a lot of them because they're going to be self-builds. And we don't get sill on self-builds. So there's no contribution to the infrastructure from those. You know, and I think we just need to be a bit more careful when we do this balancing act to add up all of the harmful effects that it has rather than just assume that 100 houses is good and what the hell it's a field anyway what's a field it's in my view that is quite an important view thank thank you the chilton site referred to was approved by the way councillor busby um councillor parker your next followed by councillor hinton Thank you, Chair. And, and at the risk of um, playing a game of ping pong, I will also just remind um, um, Councillor Busby that in the Kersey application, actually the officer recommendation for that was refusal and Councillor Busby himself supported the application and the loss uh, of the heritage amenity. But we're not here to discuss the uh, the Kersey application um, on his point with regard. <laughs> um, with regards to his point uh, around the sill, I think it, it's worth noting that I think I'm right in saying Joe will confirm that uh, 92 of those properties will be liable for sill, uh, I would imagine. Um, and uh, of course, 15 percent of that sill contribution will automatically come back to um, to to the parish uh, in, in order to provide um, some of the infrastructure that is uh, that's being talked about. Um, Joe, can you just um answer that point yeah yeah obviously um the private market dwellings will um deliver sill but the affordable dwellings um wouldn't be so liable neither would the um 13 self-built dwellings so um it wouldn't be the uh, 92 um sorry, excuse my um quick maths it would be um um <laughs> 55 of the market dwellings my understanding yeah. but a large a proportion will deliver sill and there are obviously a number of other um uh, contributions secured through the section 106 agreement as well and i think we we obviously need to be minded that we have no objections from the infrastructure providers and they consider that with the contribution secured that um it will be adequately addressed through this application thank you thank you um councillor hinton Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, uh, Joe's just answered my question. I was just going to uh, clarify for Councillor Parker and Councillor Busby that, of course, um, affordable housing doesn't carry any sill contribution either. So when you've got a, a social housing uh, element within a development, then there's no sill from that either. So they're, they're wonderful people in social houses. They, they don't actually have an impact on anything. Um, but uh, that's beside the point. That's, that's the rules and regulations. Um, but the other point that I was just going to make was one yep. of the positives that was being put forward was moving the village car park uh, to a different location. Is that supposed to try and encourage people to move their cars from outside their houses along the, uh, the main street uh, so that they don't get uh, in the way of everybody? Because um, anywhere else where car parking is supplied away from the, from the properties concerned, 
people don't use it for the simple reason they like to look at their car to make sure that it's not being burgled in the middle of the night. And there's no point in having an alarm on the car if you can't see whose alarm it is that's gone off uh, when it's being vandalised around the around the back of the houses in a different location. So parking in a, a village car park, I'd like to wonder who's actually going to use it. Are people going to commute to Sproughton, park up and then get on their bicycles or get on the bus? Although I think there's only one bus service goes into into Ipswich, so uh, it's all a bit uh, dubious as to what the uh, the benefits from from a lot of these aspects that are being put forward are. Uh, I'm sure that the the people of Sproughton would have some comments on that. Um, Joe, did you want to answer on that? I would have thought parking facilities are always an improvement, but uh, anyway, we'll wait and see. Joe, what's your comment? Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to um, um, make clear that um, it's additional car park. Uh, the, there's no moving of a village car park. It's just an additional village car park to the existing. Um, and um, where it's located, it's located obviously close to the allotments. Um, existing residences have uh, their, you know, their parking situation. I, I take the point that it's unlikely someone's going to want to park their car out the way around the corner. But there are potential visitors to the village, uh, visitors to the allotment who may want to drive there. And then obviously visitors to um, the um, uh, future uh, um, community office or uh, shop use on the site, uh, although that does have its own car park as well. So it is just providing another opportunity for parking to take the pressure off the uh, parking area near the uh, Lower Street Wildman Junction at present um, and just provides, like I say, opportunity for the allotment holders and such like to park. Thank you. Councillor Barrett. Thank you, Chair. Um, we've heard an awful lot and I, I wonder whether there's anything else that, that that remains to be said. So I'm going to uh, propose that we approve the application uh, in line with the officer recommendation. Um, and I'd just like to say, I think there are benefits um, that can't be just ignored. Uh, there's self-build, which I've never seen before in an application in, in the couple of years I've been doing this. So that is quite um, quite a, a nice thing to, to see happening. Um, community wood, uh, the spine road that will take some of that uh, away from that junction, which is apparently such a problem that it, it obviously does need something to be done about it. Um, the affordable <coughs> houses, the bungalows that are affordable, that's that's good. And let's not just sort of sides, uh, you know, ignore these things. Uh, village car park, who knows who's going to use it, but it's good to have. Um, retaining allotments, the additional public right away. So um, I'll see see if I can get a seconder. Yes, I'll, I'll see if I can get you a second in a moment. Could I just um, add, um, would this also include the additional comments uh, that was made by um, the case officer for the um, mix and the other points that we brought out during the discussion? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, it doesn't seem very ambitious, really, to say at least ten bungalows, um, because I think that's I think a bit of a get-out clause. Sort of word and I'll see whether um, can, uh, Joe, can you help us out on this? Uh, yes, it's just uh, the wording. <coughs> suggested was just to reflect the fact that this is outlined and the number of dwellings that may come forwards may reduce and so it may be that the housing mix uh, we go down to nine bungalows um i we just need to have a mind to be reasonable considering it is an outline stage and we haven't got a fully worked up reserve matters at the moment but i think the point that um of having a fully reasoned justification as to why it's anything less than 10 gives us uh, as officers and yourselves as members the chance to really interrogate why because i think recent experience um was it was unexpected perhaps the developer wasn't expecting to have to provide bungalows where well, this will clearly demonstrate it is an expectation of this scheme to provide bungalows and a good justification needs to be given if not i think that's what we will aim to achieve through the section 106 or condition oh so that's there and you're happy with that councillor barrett well i think it has it has to be a significant um part of the development um, because, because you know, we know we know that there's a, a need for that. It just anecdotally, uh, we are we are well, aware of that. The the applicants are listening in, so hopefully they'll be taking note as well. Anyway, um, I now must ask for a seconder, and I've seen a hand go up. Uh, I think Stephen Plum, yours was up before then. Sue Ayres, I think you came up. Uh, are you second? Um, are you yes. going to be a seconder? 
Would you yes, like to speak? Very glad. I I mm. totally agree with all the points made by Melanie, and and also I think Joe has put in a tremendous amount of work. So, um, well done. And I think we need to go with the way we've been advised by our officers. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Plum. You you were next. <clears throat> Thank. Can you hear me? Only just. Thank you, Chair. Uh, that up. You hear me now. I, yep. I've sat and listened to, to both sides of the argument here, and I, and I think it's coming down between the difference between heart and head. And I'm afraid that without um, a joint local plan or a neighbourhood plan to steer us in any other direction, we've just got to, I'm afraid, go for approval. Afraid. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Plum. Any any other comments um, before? Ah, um, Mark Russell, two planning officers, wants. Yeah, to th thanks, Chair. Yeah. I just just want to confirm before the vote. I mean, we've pretty much covered it, but but the extra bit to the recommendation will be your your delegating to officers to cover those points. We'll talk about whether it'll be in a condition or the 106 or both, but we'll deal with the, that matter afterwards. So can we at, have it that matter is delegated to officers? That relating to the two or three bedroom and the bungalow issue. Uh, Councillor Barrett, I don't know if you're happy about that. Yeah, as long as it's ambitious enough um, to to um, you know, uh, and I think that is reasonable to 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 push um, the developer to make sure that the provision is in line with you know the the committee's uh, wishes, which have been uh, clearly expressed today, to see um, the the smaller units and the bungalows. Right. So currently, Councillor that's. that's Ayers. Sorry. Uh, are, are you happy to accept that as well? Sorry. Councillor Ayres? Yes, I totally agree. Thank uh, you. Okay. Sorry, Chair, there's Mark. just still a little bit of uh, lack of clarity there. Joe has explained why a maximum of 10 would be the fair wording. Um, do I have the impression that there's a dissent from that point or will we keep it as that? I, I would like to see more, but do you not think that that is possible to express a bit more ambition? I think there's always this thing about bungalows. I understand it. But even if you look at the JLP, which, OK, is emerging and hasn't got a lot of weight, the percentage we're looking for there is, I think it's 3%, isn't it, bungalows? So that that's the way we're going forward. So why are we wanting a lot more here? You'd have to probably justify why you wanted a bit more in the way of bungalows. Unless we I take away the idea you'd like more. And we'll try, but we can't promise. I mean, maximum 10 does sound like fair wording. Yeah. Don't forget, he didn't rule out there was a, a possibility there could be a, a bungalow provision in the in the south build. Well, of course, yes. So um, uh, hopefully, even if we got one there, that that's that's an improvement, I think. But uh, I think um, perhaps 10 um, is right. But anyway, uh, Councillor Bauer, are you happy with that now? Um. Could there be a minimum? Mr Chairman. <laughs> it's up to you. Yeah, it's your proposal. Uh, I, 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 need to, I need to clear this point. Your seconder is quite happy with what's proposed. Uh, well, I can are see, you? just see it getting watered down, but... Um... Mr Chairman. Uh, Councillor Hinton, yep. Yeah, the, the uh, applicant puts in his uh, blurb that he put out to people a significant proportion of the of the homes would be bungalows. Well, he said 11%, but should we then water down a bit because it was uh, uh, a lot less than that. Yeah, but yeah. Six, mm -hmm. six out of 10 being affordable, they only leaves four open market bungalows. He's not, I agree with Councillor Barrett, he's not very significant. And I think we ought to really have a, a percentage of the total, total development as bungalows rather than a fixed number. In that way, uh, they can't wriggle out of it. Chair, maybe well, we they increase the number of houses. Um, then the I'm going to go back to Councillor Barrett. It's her proposal. Um, I, I do need you to be clear here because your seconder is quite happy at the moment yeah. uh, with what's proposed. But if, uh, you're the one proposing it. So would you like to start? To, uh, Mark, you wanted to come Chair, in just Chair, to help. I, I wondered if, if we could, um, I don't know if it's slightly irregular, just ask the applicant what they think about this, whether, whether they'd accept um, a minimum of 10. If they're here in this debate, would they actually accept that explicitly? And then we'd, we'd be clearer. I'm going to have to ask Ian about this one, uh, the legal. Um, can, can you advise me on this, Ian? We've lost him. Where's Ian? 
he's still in the meeting, Chair. I think he's. I'm here, Chairman. Sorry, yeah. You you heard all that. Um, yeah. uh, the um, Mark Russell, uh, Chief Officer here, uh, on planning at the moment has suggested that we ask the um, applicant whether he would accept a minimum of ten. Was that right? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. I mean that's a reasonable thing to do. I mean I suppose we have to be mindful that a, a planning condition has to be meet the all the usual legal and policy tests and consent of, of the applicants a good thing to have but it still has to be i'm sorry to bat it back to my planner colleagues but it if if you um i think you have to be advising the members that it, it's a reasonable condition and from what uh well i've had a member in fact i'm inclined to um councillor hinton says it's the committee that makes the decision not the applicant that's true uh, that's true and I but do if, if everybody's on board then... agreement with him yeah. on that um i it's, think i'd like to put it back to councillor barrett <laughs> Well, yeah, uh, who's the base. proposer of this, uh, unless Ian really thinks I should go back to um, the applicant and ask. Yeah, Councillor Hinton is absolutely right. I think it's just I, I wanted to be sure what the, adv the professional advice to members was about this condition, but subject to that, I'll, I'll, I'll let it rest. Well, he, 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 the agent did actually try to say that there was going to be possibly 10 and um, I think it was Councillor Hinton um, questioned it and it may have come down to about nine um, but I, I didn't get the feeling that they weren't going to play ball on this but Councillor Barrett I think it's back to you again. Yeah yeah I, I think it you know the committee want to I, I, I think the committee wants to see a significant number of uh, bungalows on this development and have been one, once bitten twice shy on this topic and if and we want I think we want to secure that uh, as, and tie it down as much as we possibly can with l minimum wriggle room if we can put in um, a minimum of 10 um, rather than that being the the uh, sort of maximum um, I, I think we should we should perhaps have a range of between uh, between 15 and 10 um, I would like to see that okay well can you work with that Mark Yes, I think that that's quite that's quite fair, Chair. I think we probably would put that in uh, in the 106 rather than as a condition. Right. Um, so I, I think I think if we say at least at least 10, that's yeah. better than 10. To 15. <laughs> at least 10 means you can't might even get more. You probably won't, but at least 10, mm. and we'd have that in the 106. So that's would okay. you be happy with that, Councillor Barrett? Yeah, yeah, I think okay. so. I'll go to your <laughs> long suffering <laughs> uh, Are you now happy with the latest proposal that's put forward? Yes, that, Chair, that, I at am. At least ten. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, that that that's got that bit sorted. Um, right now, is uh, I've got Adrian Osborne next. Thank you, Miss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd just like to get back to this local connection need. I think this needs, and you've you've spoken about this before, and and I've made this uh, obviously very prevalent on on other applications. And that is that the local connection need and the Baber wide need should come in first for the affordable housing. Uh, Gateway should not be uh, put in as a in any way to bring in others from this area without the local people or the Baber area uh, being able to, to purchase the affordable housing, it would uh, it would have a policy, uh, well, within a policy, I suppose, if there is one, um, and it would actually stop the, the situations that you know and, mm. and the members of this uh, committee know have, uh, have been put in on lots of occasions on applications. So right. I, I would like to see uh, a condition or part of, of Melanie's uh, proposal with the affordable housing that this actually is made noted on this application and if we don't then you're just going to get more and more people coming in from other areas and possibly uh, creating problems with affordability in areas. Thank yeah. you. Uh Councillor Osborne, I, I understand where you're coming from and I have strong views about it as well. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's actually part of the planning process, but I'm going to go to Rob now to see whether we can send a note to the housing department or ask somebody else to pick this up. Can somebody help us, Rob? Uh, although, Chair, I appreciate your faith in me on a planning matter, I will delegate <laughs> 
um, this to Mr. Russell, as it's not really my oh, area. Thank right. you, Chair. Okay. I, I thought perhaps that would have been outside his scope as well. Uh, anyway. Let's play pass the parcel. Yeah. Joe can answer this one and she'll answer it very well. So I'll pass over to her. <laughs> We will get you the answer, Councillor Osborne. Jo, it's all hinges on you now. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. Yes, um, the uh, committee report identifies that we have 100% nomination rights for the affordable units, and it's for the council to choose um, who those units go to. But it, it is a decision of the strategic housing team and the policies that we have with the strategic housing level. Um, and there's not a requirement within planning policies uh, to uh, go further into the nomination rights into the local connection. It is a matter which is directed by other areas of policy within the council so I, I don't think it would be reasonable for us to secure it via planning condition but certainly I think it's a matter we can raise um, with Heather Tucker and her team um, in relation to affordable housing nomination rights. Could we could we send a note from this committee that we're concerned about this point to the housing team Point the doubt that we we strongly feel that it should be local need first on the lines that Councillor Osborne has outlined. Uh, can can that be done separate to the actual plan and then? Uh, yes, certainly it can. Yes, I'm sure we can right. arrange that. Councillor Osborne, would you accept this? Yes, I, I would accept it. But once again, there, I would I would still say that you need not just local connection. You need the Baber side of this. We, after all, we're a district, mm. and it. it is the benefit of, of local people within the area and in the area that is the application is for to have the first choice of, of, of affordable housing. We, we find that... Uh, can that be picked up, um, um, Joe Hobbs? Can that be that point be picked up? Because we, we can't insist it in the planning conditions, but can that point be picked up and forwarded? Yes, certainly. Perhaps, uh, Councillor Osborne, we can have a conversation outside of this committee and agree um, some words uh, in discussion with the chair to come from this committee to the housing team. Um, we can have a discussion, separate discussion, if that's OK. And could I just ask that in future, when you get large applications like this with affordable housing on it, that we actually put that into uh, into into that uh, area before we go too far down the line? Because once we go down the line, it's lost and that's the end of that. Thank I you. don't think it's a planning consideration, but I think no, we no, need no. to find somewhere to bring this up. And I have understand, a... but without the planning, oh, without the planning committee making these observations, uh, you're going to get the same old stuff day yep. in, day out, year in, year out. Yeah, well, we you. may have to uh, keep adding these notes on each one if, if, until we well, can get it changed. Well, that's the only way that actually you're going to actually help the the local people within mm -hmm. the district and the and the local area. Thank you. Right. Well, you'll take this up with uh, Joe after the meeting. Uh, Robert, you're trying to get me. Sorry, very quickly, Chair, just before Mr. Russell will come in and speak. Um, I just wanted to check that because obviously with what Councillor Osborne has just said, um, we would need to check that with the proposer in a second. Uh, um, oh. I'll, I'll thank, do that. That's just that point. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Barrett, um, are, are you happy that we um, get a note sent from the committee after we've had the words and that agreed um, between Councillor Osborne, myself, the Vice Chairman and uh, Joe? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Councillor Ayers. Yeah, OK. That's, that's fine. Um, Mark? Chair, can I just be clear that nothing that we've just discussed there is going to change the recommendation of this application today? No, that, that's it. That's one minute clear. Yeah. Going forward, yeah, yeah, it, it's it's going to be sent to to, to our housing department, and uh, they can then take it on board. Right, uh, I think I've still got uh, Councillor Busby. I see your hand has uh, come up. Yeah, I think uh, it's interesting when you start talking about the the housing split and whatever, it automatically puts into people's mind that they're accepting this uh, application and I think before we make the decision we should remember that 335 residents mm. opposed this now that's about 50 percent probably higher than 50 percent of the population of Sproughton now I can't remember ever seeing an application come before this committee with such a high proportion of objections from the locals. These are the people who have got to live with that, the consequences of our decision. 
we should be very careful about saying yes to something that we wouldn't want to live next to if we were there. So whilst it's good to start talking about the housing split and who's going to live there and whatever, let's be sure that we really want these houses on that hillside overlooking these listed buildings. Well, the proposer and seconder have already proposed and seconded and I would assume that they've already taken all those into consideration before they made their deliberations on it. Um, uh, Councillor Ayres. Oh, uh, I thought I'd remove my hand. No, I uh, just said, let's, shall we get on with the vote? Sorry, oh, sorry, like yes, go on. I said, you know, we've had a proposal, I've seconded it, can we get on with the vote? Because we're not in debate, are we? Right. Well, yeah, we're still in debate, but it's been proposed and seconded that there, there isn't any more hands up. So with that, then, members, if you're all finished, I'm going to ask Rob to do a roll call. Uh, it's been proposed and seconded by Councillor Barrett um, and Councillor Ayres that we accept the officer's recommendation. And we're going to send a note of, uh, in due course to the housing department. Um, Rob. Would you like to take us through the roll call? Thank you, Chair. So if members could please respond with for, against or abstain. So, Councillor Sue Ayres. For. Councillor Melanie Barrett. For. Councillor Peter Beer. For. Councillor David Busby. Against. Councillor John Hinton. Against. Councillor Lee Jameson. Against. Councillor Mary McLaren. For. Councillor Adrian Osborne. Against. Councillor Alison Owen. Against. Councillor Lee Parker. For. And Councillor Stephen Plum. For. Thank you, Chair. I make that six votes to five. Could I just confer with my colleague, yes. Mr. Dupre? Yes, indeed, I counted. I, may, I also make that six votes for and five votes against. Thank, Thank you, Chair. You. That's carried. Thank you, members. Then that is carried. That is approved. Um, right. We're, it's now 17 minutes past one. Um, do you wish to take a break or do you wish to continue with the next item, members? Get on with it. It ain't going to take very long, is it? Continue. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Rob, do we st do we have the members present who want this public speakers? Um, Councillor Arfi, I, well, it's not a public, obviously, and Councillor Maybury. Yep, I will just check um, that Councillor Arthi has joined us again. Chair, if you will bear with me one moment. If, if he hasn't already, if he doesn't speak up now, I will just drop him an email very quickly yes i'm here yes. oh okay. that, that means yeah. we're all here chair i believe if well Councillor done Maybury could just right. as well. yes we'll... i'm i'm here thank, thank you, thank you Councillor Maybury. um samantha can you take us through this bear in mind it's lunchtime <laughs> yes i will do thank you chair <laughs> can you all hear me yes yeah and you can see my screen chair yes yep okay i'll get on with it then <laughs> Uh, this application relates to land to the rear of the Plough and Fleece public house on Great Green in Cockfield. The application came to committee on 17th of June this year, where members resolved to grant outline planning permission for the erection of up to 28 dwellings, the repositioning of three dwellings under a previous permission to allow for access into the site. This was subject to a signed Section 106 agreement to secure affordable housing contribution, public open space and a highways contribution towards improvements to a footpath. Uh, the application comes back to committee because there were discrepancies within the committee report and committee uh, presentation in relation to affordable housing. The committee report and presentation were based on this indicative layout plan, which clearly shows 11 affordable dwellings. This is based on 28 new dwellings and three dwellings to be repositioned at the entrance to the site, bringing the total number of dwellings within the red line to 31. 
The strategic housing team have confirmed that the contribution for affordable housing should be 10.85 dwellings for 31 dwellings. Four comments can be found in the addendum papers. The developer has offered 11 affordable units on the site. Unfortunately, I made a mistake in the committee report under the recommendation and stated that 12 units should be provided on the section 106. This figure was taken from a previous strategic housing consultation response before the number of dwellings was reduced from 34 to 31 during the course of the application. I apologise for the confusion. Officers recommend that the affordable housing contribution is amended from 12 to 11 units as per the strategic housing team's uh, consultation response. This is in line with the committee presentation on the 17th of June. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right, well, I have to go through the procedure. Uh, see if there's any points of clarification. I'm quite happy. It was a genuine mistake on your part. And you, you've, you've seen it and rectified it. And um, I think all good credit to you uh, on that. Um, it is a minor thing, really. But anyway, members, is there uh, Councillor Hinton? Councillor sorry, Hinton, Mr. You're... Chairman, my hand was still up. I, oh, I agree with it's not the first time we've had a mistake and it won't be the last because we're all human. Absolutely. Well done. A any other comments? No. Uh, Councillor Plum, sorry. Uh, thanks, Chair. All I was going to say, let's get on. I propose that we accept the officer's recommendation. Uh, well, I, I, I <laughs> as much as I'd like to jump it, uh, because lunch is waiting, but um, I have to go through public speakers. We don't have any. I now must ask the ward members if they wish to speak. Um, Councillor Clive Arfey and Councillor Margaret Maybury. I'll take ladies first. Um, Councillor Maybury. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I won't keep you long, so lunch won't be too delayed as long as I can get this up on screen. Um, Sorry, just trying to get it up on screen. Right, for me, anyway. Um, thank you, Mr Chairman, for allowing me to speak. The opportunity to comment on this application regarding the affordable portion of the development is an opportunity to thank the developers for supporting the call and the build-out of affordable homes for those in need of a home at a price they can afford. I am sure members of the committee are well aware of my call for Homes for Life, which I'm um, very pleased to see has, is being written into the emerging joint local plan and is mentioned here in the papers in front of you. I would like to comment before I say anything else on the landscaping part of the development, and I know that's not a consideration at the moment. Um, and that is for the need for the trees and the hedge line to the north and northwest of the site to be maintained. Can I just interrupt you? Can you stop yes. the clock, Rob? Uh, is that relevant? Because we're only dealing with this point of the fact that um, it changes from 12 to 11. We're not going through the full plan and application uh, at this stage now, or are we? Um, no, we're not, Mr. That, Chairman. Uh, um, sorry, uh, sorry, Councillor Mabry, I, I, I've just got to take advice on it. Okay. Can somebody, uh, Samantha or Rob or Ian, can somebody yep. tell us? This relates only to the Section 106 contribution yep. for affordable housing. So I'm sorry, Councillor Mabry, you must uh, keep your comments purely to the 106 bit. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sure you're all well aware that I do like, like to make comments on things, but I will take that back um, uh, if that is appropriate. Back, just carry on. Okay. Um, at this juncture, I would like to thank the planning officer and her senior manager for their apologies to us ward members of the area that occurred previously with the numbers regarding the site and the affordable housing. In my book, an apology makes many things better. And after all, we are human, which another member has already mentioned, and these things happen. The success of this application being reheard is that the fact that the number of affordable housing stays at um, a number of 11, giving the hope of a home for many. So thank you very much. 
thank you. And it did show Levin on the plans that were shown to us all the way through. Um, right, uh, members, I have to ask you, have you any questions for Councillor Maybury? Oh, believe it or not, there's no hands gone up. Well done. Uh, we'll come to Councillor Clive Arfi. You sir, also have five minutes with just the committee. Have you anything to say? Well, just very briefly to, to add something to um, what Samantha said, um, what she didn't mention was that there had been a suggestion from the applicant um, that the affordable contribution should be calculated on the 28 rather than the 31. Um, and they accordingly were offering um, nine affordable units and a contribution. Um, so um, many thanks to Samantha for, for sorting that out, getting agreement from the applicant, and really we're, we're just back to where we should have been had there not been a, a very slight error in the previous report. So thank you, Samantha, and I urge you all just to um, approve it. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Councillor Arthur. Members, any questions? There's no hands up, so I'm going to move through that. Um, and we're up for debate. Um, I think Councillor Plum, uh, I'll come back to you now. Thank you, Chair. I see no reason why we should waste any more time at all. Um, I propose that we accept the officer's recommendation. Councillor Barrett, are you seconding it? Yes, I am. Thank you. Do you wish to comment? No. Thank you. It's been proposed and seconded. There's no more hands gone up. So, um, as Councillor Barrett, your hand is still up. Thank you. Uh, so, I'm going to put the proposal. Um, it's been proposed and seconded. Um, Robert, can you take the roll call, please, for approval? Thank you, Chair. So, as previously, members, if you could please respond with for, against, or abstain. So, Councillor Sue Ayres. Four. Councillor Melanie Barrett. Four. Councillor Peter Beer. Four. Councillor David Busby. Four. Councillor John Hinton. Four. Councillor Lee Jameson. Four. Councillor Mary McLaren. Four. Councillor Adrian Osborne. Four. Councillor Alison Owen. Four. Councillor Lee Parker. Four. And Councillor Stephen Plum. Four. Thank you, well, Chair. That is unanimous. unanimously carried. <laughs> yes, indeed. Unanimous. I agree. Sorry. Thank, thank you, you two. Uh, right, members, we've got to the end of the meeting. It's been a long one. Uh, the date of the next meeting, which was supposed to be Wednesday, 21st of October, has been cancelled because we've no business that day. So the next meeting is now scheduled for Wednesday, the 4th of November at 9.30. Uh, I'd like to thank all the officers, all the members, all the ward members that have joined us this morning and the public who have been watching. Thank you for your time and uh, 